for coming to our Q&A session with Hubert Lacroix. Um, this is part of the Tribune Publication Society's and Daily Publication Society's Journalism and Media Conference. Um, the theme this year is Journalism Redefined. How did we get here and where do we go now? Um, the conference is sponsored by uh, Montreal Press Club, uh, Media at McGill, Café Le Mosaïque, and David's Tea. Bonjour tout le monde. Alors merci d'être venu à notre session de questions et réponses organisée dans le cadre de la semaine du journalisme présentée par la Société des publications du Daily ainsi que la Société des publications du Tribune. Le thème de cette année est « Redéfinir le journalisme, où en sommes-nous et où allons-nous » La conférence est sponsorisée par le Montréal Press Club, Media at McGill, la Cafeteria Le Mosaïque et l'été David Stee. Um, so my name is Dominic, I'm a news editor at the McGill Tribune. Um, today we'll be speaking with Hubert Lacroix, the CEO and President of CBC. Um, the panel will last approximately 45 minutes, with 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Donc, euh, je m'appelle Margot et je suis directrice de la section actualité pour euh, le seul journal francophone de l'Université McGill, euh, Le Daily. Donc, euh, notre invité ce soir, c'est euh, Hubert Lacroix, qui est euh, le PDG et le euh, CEO de Radio-Canada et de CBC. Le panel va durer approximativement euh, 45 minutes et il y aura 15 minutes à la fin euh, pour des questions de l'audience. Um, so, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that McGill University is situated on Uh, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe uh, nations, which have long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. Um, we recognize and respect these peoples as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we meet today. Avant de commencer, nous aimerions reconnaître que l'Université McGill est située sur les territoires traditionnels de nations Haudenosaunee et Anishinaabe, les terres qui ont longtemps servi comme endroit de rencontre et d'échange pour les peuples indigènes. Nous reconnaissons et respectons ces peuples comme gardiens traditionnels de ces terres sur lesquelles nous nous rencontrons aujourd'hui. Um, so a bit more on our speaker, uh, Hubert was uh, appointed president and CEO of CBC uh, Radio Canada on November 5th, 2007. Uh, on October 5th, 2012, he was reappointed for a second five-year term, and he will remain in this role until the government's nomination process is complete. Um, before joining the CBC, Hubert was a special counsel in the law firm Steichman Elliott. Uh, he sat on a number of boards for several corporations and non-profits, um, and he earned his law degree and MBA at McGill. Donc, euh, je vais en parler un peu plus sur euh, notre invité ce soir. Donc, euh, Hubert Lacroix, euh, avant d'être euh, à Radio Canada et CBC, était euh, exécutive, euh, chairman exécutive de, de la corporation euh, Télémédia. Euh, et, euh, et il a aussi été associé principal à McCarthy Tetro pendant presque 20 ans. De plus, il a siégé au conseil d'administration de nombreuses grandes entreprises et d'organismes à but non lucratif. Il a été euh, nommé euh, président et, euh, et DG de Radio-Canada en euh, 2007 pour un premier mandat de 5 ans, pour être ensuite réappointé en 2012 pour un second mandat. Présentement, euh, le gouvernement est, est en train de faire le processus nominatif. Donc, euh, voilà. Et aussi, euh, il a fait son euh, éducation euh, universitaire à l'université McGill, en commençant par un bachelor en droit, pour ensuite faire un master en business administration, et il a étudié au cégep euh, Jean Brébeuf avant ça. Merci pour venir. Coming back to my neighborhood is always a lot of fun. It's like I never left. Um, the surroundings, uh, law, fa law faculty, obviously, des hôtels at, uh, at the bottom of Sherbrooke, but also. What was most important, my most important link with McGill, is I was the head basketball coach here of the women's basketball program for 10 years. So um, my fondest memories are the Sir Arthur Curry gym and the number of hours we spent from about September 15th every year to March 15th running our basketball program. So um, you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, as we go along. So thanks for inviting me. Um, so tell us more about your time at McGill. So, came out of Brebeuf, uh, kid, 18 years old, into directly law school. That was a mistake when you look back on, uh, on my choice, seriously. Um, you're 18 years old, uh, the, average of the average age of, um, of the classroom is about 25, 26. Uh, the major concern, I, well, yeah, you're having classes on constitutional law and family law and leases and custody battles and my major concern was trying to get the keys from my father and mother uh, to get the car on Saturday night to take my date to a movie. 
so you know the the uh, the environment in which I am is kind of different. Did that, graduated from law, uh, started working right away, and then uh, after when my law firm, it was called O'Brien Hall and Saunders at that time, merged, I came back to school. I was the head basketball coach at that time, at McGill. I was also the provincial basketball coach. Ran the women's program there. I was involved with basketball. I mean, 50% of my life was basketball, and that's why I chose to do the MBA here so I could continue coaching my team. Did that, uh, graduated with the MBA, decided I had investment banking offers and I had law. I didn't think I knew anything about law after three years of law, so I continued in law. Went to a firm called Clarkson Tetro, which merged. I was very involved in the merger of that firm. I was involved in the management of my firm. Uh, and then st spent 20 years there. And on Jan 1, 2000, I decided to leave that and to join Tede Media Corp. My, one of my clients at that time. Tidemi Corp is the private holding company of a family, a very important uh, French-Canadian family called Les De Gaspé Beaubien. Monsieur De Gaspé Beaubien was the mayor of Expo 67. He's the guy that put together the actual exposition. Nobody in this room was born in 1967. That's okay. Uh, but there was a very important, uh, well, that's why you see uh, the islands and, you know, La Boule de, du Pavillon des États-Unis and uh, the casino, and that's where the the, uh, the race is run every year on Sacré du Neuf. That's because of what Monsieur de Gaspé Beaumier did. So I went there, managed their corporation for five years. Then the kids who I was, the kids who were 50, 40 something, 35 and 30, decided that they loved each other very much, but didn't want to work together. So we undid what we had built. Uh, we gave the assets away. We sold some assets. We sold at that time. Uh, Telemedia had 21 radio stations when I came in. We had 82 radio stations when I exited. We were with CBC at that time, CBC Radio Canada, the largest private um, uh, radio company. We had, we were literally, we were trying to build a great Canadian radio company. So we sold 50% of our assets to Astral, uh, Astral, and then to the Slate family in Toronto. Astral then bought all of the stations that we had sold to Slate. And then Bell bought all of the assets that, frankly, we had sold to both companies. So now all of the 80-some radio stations that were uh, telemedia stations ended up in the hands of Bell. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, in 2005, people asked me to put my name in for CBC Radio Canada's top job. I said no. They came back to me in 2007. I said no again twice. In then the third time, I said, all right, I'll put my name down, but this is only a political job, and I'm not interested in politics. I'm not a political person. I have no political color. Um, and I thought that the only thing that you did as president and CEO of CBC Radio Canada was basically handle the relationship with the government. And I was not interested in that at all. I thought I, had, I wanted to actually impact the job in the corporation I worked for and led. So the headhunter said, no, try, and you won't see a, and as soon as you see an elected uh, official in the hiring process, you can leave. And I got, got conned into continuing on and didn't see a, uh, an MP until the minister, when she, I was, they decided that it, all sorts of interviews. Actually, I should tell you about this. So you get, you get to a first interview, it's pretty funny, uh, with the chairman and some, some, um, some bureaucrat from Ottawa. Bureaucrat in a nice way, because every time you use the word bureaucrat, people think of a person who is slow, doesn't work very hard, and you have this vision of a bureaucrat. My vision of bureaucrats is completely different. They work their butts off, they are very, very good at what they do, and they actually care about the country. So, uh, so this guy and my chairman at that time interview me, then I'm brought into a second interview, and literally, like in school, it's, a, it's an open book exam, it's three hours in Ottawa, the person comes in, clicks her watch, they give you the books, you write like crazy for three hours, you hand the books back, I never know, I, I, to this day I don't know what I wrote in those books, and the questions are, um, so what's the mandate of the CBC, what would you do if you were running the CBC, do you have issues of this and that, so three hours of questions, you hand the books back, then there's another process where you have a panel, and in that panel they have deputy ministers of different departments, and uh, then they say, okay, you're the uh, person that uh, we would like to push forward. 
and I got a 20-minute call by the minister, José Werner, at that time, who said, do you still want this job? Because I understand that you've said no to it a few times. And I said, yes, I'd like that. And the next thing you know, uh, on Jan 1, well, on November 5, I'm, I'm, I'm announced. On Jan 1, 2008, I start working. My mandate has ended uh, after two terms. I'm not supposed to be talking to you as the president and CEO of CBC Radio Canada right now because my mandate ended December 31. On December 20th, the government said, Lacroix, we have issues trying to find a person to replace you. Would you stay on until we do? And there's no way in the world that after having worked for 10 years that I'm going to give this, corp this extraordinary corporation to an empty chair. So I'm staying in this job until they find somebody. The chairman made the same commitment. And uh, we hope that um, they reopen the job. They made more, they did more interviews. And we hope that in the next weeks, um, somebody is going to be selected and take over my job. So in a nutshell, that's how I got from Brebeuf to McGill Law, to McGill MBA, to uh, the gym, to here. Alors, est-ce qu'il y a des aspects du droit que vous retrouvez dans le monde des médias? Des aspects du droit? Des aspects euh, juridiques. La discipline, puis, oui, évidemment. Euh, il y a toutes sortes de... de... Si j'avais été un meilleur étudiant en droit constitutionnel, quand j'étais à, à la faculté de droit, je serais un meilleur euh, président, je serais la direction, au moins j'aurais été meilleur dans mes premiers jours, parce que comprendre... La distinction entre le cabinet du premier ministre, le greffier du conseil privé, les relations entre euh, les membres qui sont élus, la bureaucratie qui est à avoir encore une fois la bureaucratie avec un, avec un grand B, et le rôle que nous on joue, ça aurait été beaucoup plus facile pour moi de le comprendre. Évidemment, on le comprend à la fin d'y avoir passé dix ans de notre vie. Euh, il y a toutes sortes de contrats commerciaux. Euh, C'est moi, par exemple, qui ai été au centre de la négociation qui, des Olympiques pour la couverture de, par Bell, par Rogers et par CBC Radio Canada de ce que vous avez vu, j'espère, pendant 17 jours. Bien, vous avez vu que les trois broadcasters travaillent ensemble. Alors, cette entente-là, c'est moi qui l'ai négociée avec euh, George Cope et à ce moment-là Nadia Mohamed qui était chez Rogers, puis maintenant avec euh, Guy Lawrence qui l'a suivi. Alors, oui, il y a toutes sortes de choses qu'on fait qui nous prépare pour ça, mais qui nous prépare jamais pour la job de président de CBC Radio-Canada. C'est impossible d'être prêt pour une job comme celle-là. Um, do you think that, as a public broadcaster, CBC has a special uh, niche role in Canadian media? Well, I don't, th I, think, I don't think it's niche. I think that there's nobody that does news, nobody that does culture, nobody that cares about democracy as much as the people that work at CBC Radio-Canada. And I'm, I'm not saying this because it's corporate speak. When you speak to the people, and man, Adrienne's in the room, and I just saw Julian walking out. These people, every day, every day, they cover news because they actually do care about the enlightenment, this, this idea of educating, this idea of informing, enlighten, and entertaining, the three verbs in our mandate that we keep repeating. This is why we wake up in the morning, and it's, I mean, you walk into CBC Radio Canada, you look at the work that everybody does, and then you look at the importance, particularly in an environment where there's so much stuff going on. I, t I took in about three minutes of Julian's presentation in the back of the room as I was waiting for Holly to come up, and I saw the, uh, the issue with fake news. I saw some of the statements made by Trump. I saw all these things. Well, because of those statements, the Washington Post and the, and the New York Times are now working behind a paywall, and it's actually working because people want to know what the truth is. We are the most trusted news organization in this country. All the polls show that Canadians come to us because they know about our journalistic standards and practices. Our policies, the fact that we actually double, triple check what we have. And when you come to us, you can be assured that we've done our homework, and that what you're going to be watching on the national, on one of our digital platforms, or on what you're going to hear on radio, is actually the facts. So it's not niche. It's, I think we are the locomotive right now, particularly in an environment where the newspaper industry is trying to find out where it wants to go. Uh, I think they missed the digital shift. We were forced into a digital shift because of the resource issues that we had, the financial issues that we had, and we just accelerated this in 2014, and we went all in on digital. We completely reversed our priorities. We used to be clearly 
when you looked at us, we were television, we were radio, we were what we called the web, and then we were, well, the web, the computer-based web, and then we were mobility. Now we are clearly mobility first. We are clearly, clearly anything which is digital second, the web, regional websites, regional pages. We are then radio, and television is, I won't say the fourth priority because you'll think that we don't care about television, but clearly digital is first. That's how we drive our business now. Everything we look at, every decision we make is through the lens of how can we tell this story in a digital way. Justement, euh, concernant toutes ces évolutions qui ont eu lieu dans euh, la forme euh, des euh, différents médias, est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose que vous aimeriez faire revenir euh, qui venait du passé, qui, qui est un des aspects des médias d'aujourd'hui qui sera supprimé? Si je pouvais gagner quelque chose, ce serait du temps, parce que maintenant, on n'a plus de temps avec les plateformes dans lesquelles on est. Euh, mais faire revenir quelque chose dans le temps, non. Quand on a fait, euh, quand le gouvernement actuel a décidé de réinvestir dans CBC Radio-Canada, parce que vous avez sûrement lu qu'on a passé un temps où c'était très compliqué chez nous, on a presque 650 ou 675 millions de dollars qu'on a vu retirer directement et indirectement de notre ligne de revenus. Ça nous a coûté presque 3 000 jobs. Et là, on a vu le gouvernement fédéral libéral réinvestir 75 millions de dollars dans la première année et 150 millions de dollars euh, pour les années suivantes. La première chose que les syndicats m'ont demandé, ou en fait, non seulement moi, mais de façon très, très affichée, c'est on veut réinvestir dans les jobs qu'on vient de couper. Les 3 000 jobs, la croix que tu as coupée, on, on veut les revoir. Et là, on a dit non, non, ce n'est pas du tout ça. On a changé la direction dans laquelle on est. Ce qu'on cherche maintenant, on cherche des habiletés qui vont nous permettre, à travers notre virage numérique, puis à travers les lancers de, de vous parler sur vos plateformes et vos téléphones, euh, c'est maintenant notre priorité. Alors, on ne revient plus en arrière, au contraire. The, the two space is clearly out of the tube. It's not going back in. Um, what do you consider the costs and benefits of the CBC's arm length relationship with the government? You, I mean, we are clearly a public broadcaster. We are not a state broadcaster. And this dance that we play with the government is very important for people to understand the relationship that we have. There's an arm's length relationship, which is, you know, on va parler droit deux minutes, clearly entrenched in all of the legislation, the Broadcasting Act, the Financial Administration Act, clearly say that we do not have to share our corporate, our corporate direction, our strategy. Nobody approves the direction in which we are going. I'll give you a couple of examples. When the government of the time in 2012, or two, yeah, 2012, started what they called the Deficit Reduction Action Plan, the famous DRAP, Conservative Party, took out in one swoop 115 million bucks out of our budget. Nobody in government could actually tell us where that 115 million dollars was going to be taken out of. They couldn't say, we want you to cut down this program or that platform or three stations. That's all us. What I did when I saw it in front of the Treasury Board is I informed them of the decisions that we took based on our best judgment as a senior management team, as a board of directors of CBC Radio-Canada, this is what we thought we could do and the choices we could make. In the same way that when Milani Joly and her group invested all of these 675 million bucks over five years, when she came and she said, all right, um, here are the dollars. At the beginning, it's really difficult for the government to, particularly a new government, to understand that they can't direct where those, where those dollars are going to go. If they, if they have a priority of, I don't know, indigenous issues, or if they have a priority of where the, the areas, of the, I don't know, the, um, um, they want us to cover issues coming out of the north or out of, out of BC or whatever else, they can't decide what we're going to cover. They can't decide where the dollars are coming back. So it took us a year to come to a conclusion and an understanding that they could give us the dollars, thank you very much, and that we would make ourselves very accountable. Because if there's one thing we do pretty, actually pretty good, we do this extremely well, is we'll tell you where your dollars go. And if you go to our website, there's something called the accountability report, where we, sh where we will show you everything we, are, we will done and we will have done with these 75 million bucks in year one, 150 million dollars in year two, down to literally line items. So you know exactly where the dollars are going. So again, it's a question of making sure 
that there's a, there's a distance between the government and us. Because in, I mean, people think that I decide what, and again, I'm going to point out to Adrian, what Adrian Arsenault is going to do next week or what, uh, what the newsroom is going to do the, year, the week after. I have never, never picked up the phone to speak to Jennifer McGuire, who is the editor-in-chief on Anglais, and to Michel Cormier in French to influence anything coming out of the newsroom. There's a wall between me and the newsroom. There's a wall between me and programming schedules. Because you cannot do indirectly what you can't do directly, meaning that because I'm appointed by the government, there's the only way for me to get my job is the prime minister has to sign the order in council and then the governor general has to sign the order in council. That's the only way for you to get my job. Because of that, you can't indirectly, because they can't phone, the minister can't phone the newsroom, they can't use me to influence the newsroom, and they can't influence, they can't use the uh, director on our board to go influence the newsroom either. C'est complètement hermétique. Et ça, c'est super important de comprendre cette relation distance-là entre le broadcaster et nous. And I've, I, I mean, I've had some issues with governments over 10 years, but I have never had an issue with a person in government not understanding that they can't influence our newsroom. That's, that's never happened. And how has it evolved after the Bill C-60? Ah, oui. The Bill C-60, that's a very good example. So, government at one point in time runs a, um, or decides that it's going to introduce this bill, Bill C-60. It was about four, maybe four or five years ago, where they wanted to introduce in the relationship between an employer and an employee, they wanted to introduce the government as a I call them a voya, but it's not supposed to be a voya, as an, an interested bystander at the table of the at the negotiation table. And we said, this is absolutely nuts. I mean, I mean, we're dealing with the unions, and imagine I'm going to have a person from government standing right there, and you don't think that the union person is going to be speaking to the government person instead of me? That doesn't work. So we were very adamant and very, very clear. On était très, très, uh, très clair dans notre... Uh, parce que la question est en français. Euh, très clair dans notre, euh, dans notre façon d'interpréter, pas d'interpréter, mais de repousser le gouvernement. On s'est présenté avec une lettre qui était très dure, et ça, c'était un exemple de la distance qui nous sépare entre le gouvernement et le broadcaster. Jamais il m'est venu dans l'idée de dire, bon, mais parce que ça va faire de la peine à Flaherty ou à Clement, euh, je ne déposerai pas ma lettre et euh, m'inscrivant en faux contre l'idée du gouvernement de venir s'ingérer dans nos relations euh, syndicales. That doesn't work. So there's not even a minute of hesitation between that. It's not because Flaherty, or at that time Mr. Flaherty, or Mr. Clement, who is still uh, in his job, well, in job, still an elected person, um, it's not because we're going to be butting heads with them that we're not going to uh, do what we have to do to push back and protect our, our interests. Um, how do you think that uh, CBC's business model uh, is different from other public broadcasts? broadcasters' business models? So we have, uh, I'll tell you that we have a different bro uh, business model, and I'll tell you right away that it's broken. It's not the 675 billion bucks that solve that issue. We are financed this way. On one, let's say, and I'll, I'll just take shortcuts, but on 100% of the top revenue line that we have, about 65% comes from government appropriation. So a check from government, this famous dollar, these famous dollars that the, the federal government improved on by 675 million bucks over, over, 15, over five years. We also have commercial revenues. Commercial revenues, which would be ad revenues to the tune of about 250 to 275 million dollars a year. That's only television um, uh, revenues, ad revenues from TV. We have, as you know, no ads on radio. And the digital piece is about 35 to 30, 30 to 35 million dollars. So it's insignificant when you look at the 1.6 billion dollars, which is our top line. And it's growing, but it's growing really slowly. It's 35 million dollars more than zero, but that's not much. And just to put things in perspective, uh, 150 million dollars a year for us, people say it's a lot of money, but it's six weeks of payroll. So again, it's, it's, there's a 52-year uh, cycle in a year, a 52-week cycle in a year. So put that in perspective, too. So that's the way we are financed. The BBC is financed through, as you know, a license fee. It just went up this week, 150 pounds 50 
per uh, citizen, per Brit. It's one time zone, and there's close to 70 million of them. In Canada, when you're going to be working and paying taxes, you're going to give us right now $34 per year, per year of your taxes to the public broadcaster. 34 bucks a year. That compares to an average of the 18 most important public broadcasters in the world of about $87 per citizen. We are, of the 18 most important broadcasters in the world, we are ranked number 16 in terms of funding per capita. So when you want us to be compared to the BBC, the BBC is 100 and something, 110 or 112 dollars Canadian, the equivalent. We are funded to the tune of 34 bucks per Canadian. There's 34 million of us, well, 36 million of us, and we work in two official languages across the country. So yeah, the BBC works in different languages, but not in the mother corp. It works out of the, the other languages in one of the subsidiaries, which is a commercial company, actually. It's BBC Worldwide, and it's a different, different situation. So why am I saying that the business model is broken? Because we are not adjusted for inflation, except for salaries, so our costs be going up. Ad revenues, as you know, are going nowhere but south. Google and the other search engines are the ones that are gobbling up all of these ad revenues. So we're in a position where every single year we start the year and we're down 15 to $18 million when you look at inflation adjusted. So we have to make cuts and we have to adjust for that. And the bridge that they gave us, and we're very happy to have this, this $150 million more a year, allowed us to slow down some of the cuts we were making, put the fingers in the dam, the water stopped going over, but it's not going to work. The government has to decide what it wants to do with us. Are we going to be a BBC funded through a license fee with predictable, predictable funding? I don't, know what my funding, I don't know what my funding or our funding is going to be for the next year. I'm going to know tomorrow when uh, Minister Morneau is going to stand up in the House of Commons and he's going to deliver his budget. I'm going to know whether the dollars we hope to get it are going to work. And our tax year starts on April 1. So if ever we have a big surprise or a nasty surprise in the budget, we have about six weeks to adjust. No corporation, no $1.6 billion corporation works that way. Um, when you look at the other countries in the world, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which is the closest thing we compare ourselves to, same kind of country, same geography, same kind of population, populated along the borders, very important indigenous issues, or not issues, but uh, roots. Well, they are 98% funded by government. I can go on and on giving you models, but in a situation like ours, funded 40% by commercial revenues, you want us to be the broadcaster leading the vision of the minister, which she, um, which she uh, tabled in uh, September of 2017, you're going to have to deal with our funding model once and for all. And that's why we tabled a position paper saying that we want to go ad-free. We want to go ad-free in order to have stable, multi-year funding. Yeah, we can come up for air every third year, every fourth year, every fifth year for accountability. We'll do that. But you need to be able to give us a funding model that is not uh, crumbling in 2018 if you want us to play our role. Uh, so what about uh, in the U.S. where NPR and PBS and other public broadcasters have their funding threatened by the government frequently? Yeah, it's the second time uh, Mr. Trump has done that. Um, he's attacked the um, PBS particularly. Um, but you know that PBS, PBS is not a public broadcaster like the other public broadcasters in the world. PBS is a constellation of 350 or 360 different stations. It has four or five stations that actually creates content. The, the programming director in Albany, uh, not in Albany, but in, um, in Vermont, that we always get over the top here, um, Burlington or whatever it is, he can decide or she can decide whatever she wants to do on her programming schedule. And it can be different programming than somebody else running another PBS station. So you can't compare PBS and NPR to us. NPR, by the way, which is a great uh, television, uh, radio network, has about the funding, $1.2, $1.3 billion, that we have for the whole of CBC Radio Canada. So that's only radio in the States. PBS has a different mandate, as you know. It doesn't do news. It doesn't cover the world. It has great uh, public affairs show. It's trying to do something different on, uh, because of their kids' programming. 
They've lost some properties. They're trying to become digital. I mean, I really I have great respect for PBS, but they're not a BBC, ABC, uh, France Télévision. Uh, uh, they're a different kind of beast. And PR is more like CBC Radio Canada's radio network, uh, but again, funded in a completely different way. How do you think that all this history of funding will evolve in the future? We have to evolve in favor of a model of financing that will allow us to know, year after year, in a way predictable, how are our sources of revenue. We can't ask the public radio with the mandate we have in 2018 to continue to be fragilized by, for example, the government of the moment. Et c'est pour ça que dans nos demandes qui accompagnent celles d'être un radiodiffuseur public qui, euh, qui que, dont, dont les ondes n'ont pas de publicité, on veut avoir du, du financement qui s'étalerait sur cinq ans. Parce que nos licences, nos conditions de licence du CRTC, qui nous permettent à nous, CBC Radio-Canada, de vous offrir les services que vous avez devant vous, bien, elles valent pour cinq ans. Alors, on voudrait que le, le, notre financement soit collé sur ces cinq années-là, pour que je ne, la, la personne qui aura ma job ne se pose pas la question le 27 mars, le 27 ou le 26 février à 17h38, est-ce que demain, le ministre des Finances va être méchant à notre égard et euh, nous enlèvera un morceau de notre financement directement ou indirectement? We can't do this in an environment like, like this. It makes no sense. Il se fait longtemps que je dis ça. Écoutez, je vais vous donner juste un exemple. Si vous, un jour vous gérez une entreprise, on n'a pas de ligne de crédit chez CBC Radio-Canada. La ligne de crédit que vous avez, the credit line that you have on your Visa card or on your American Express card or whatever card you use, your credit card, is bigger than the credit line we have at CBC Radio-Canada because we have none. So when we bump into cuts, every, out of every dollar invested at CBC Radio-Canada, 60 cents is a, is a job. So 60% of our, um, of our expenses are jobs. What do you think happens when we cut a job? There's severance that comes with it. Now, normally, when I used to manage corporations, I would go and I would dip into our credit line with a bank, and I would smooth out the impact of putting 25, 250, or 2,500 people out of work, right? Because you're, you're gonna pay severance, you're gonna take care of them, you, you, you feel awful about cutting those jobs out. But now, we don't have a credit line. So where do you think we take our dollars? We take our dollars within CBC Radio-Canada. So we go to all sorts of places at CBC on our budgets that don't, are not connected to a job. What do I mean? Promotion budgets for next year's programming schedule. Okay? So let's say that you wanted to spend five million bucks um, um, promoting your Radio-Canada or CBC television schedule. Now you decide, Okay, I'm going to take $3 million out, and I'm going to tell Heather Conway and Michelle Bissonnette that they only have 60% or 40% that they have before, because I know that when I take those dollars away, there's not a job connected to it, so I don't have to pay severance on top of the dollars that I'm taking away. So those are the kind of crazy situations that we are involved in that were extremely, extremely painful. So when they cut us 115, for example, it was actually a $240 million cut that we had to manage because we took the first pass 900 jobs out, the second pass 645, and then the last one out close to 1,200 jobs. And you mentioned earlier uh, when you were uh, working with Telemedia uh, that it was bought out by other companies. Um, Bell. Actually, it sold its, some of its assets because the, the Telemedia had all sorts of assets, including radio uh, stations, and those radio stations were sold and eventually all held, now still held, by them. Okay, what, what effects do you think the monopolization of Canadian media have had on the reporting side of things? Um, it's in this environment where you get news and you get, everybody's a broadcaster, right? You can become a broadcaster with your phone. Um, you, there's no such thing as a network anymore. A blogger can become, and we've seen examples of that, a news source. They can actually be more, and they have no overhead. So I think that's, that's where we become so important. Because in all this crowded noise, and all of this information that you have, you need a trusted source. That's where CBC Radio-Canada becomes that trusted source. 
que vous pensez que ce monopole va en tirer Well, much going to, uh, there's going to be, if you read uh, Hundrich, who is the chairman of, the, of um, uh, a very important um, newspaper group in Canada right now, his model is dying. The National Post and its uh, model is dying. So there's going to be some reorgs, but that's, I mean, there's no more over certain buggy right now, and there's all sorts of things that have changed over years, right? I think that's going to be affected. I think they were very slow, these newspapers, at uh, understanding how important digital was. I think in Montreal, La Presse, as I mean, saw it. Uh, but if it wasn't for Les Démarais and the substantial investment of money that they made in La Presse Plus and uh, what you have on your iPad, and the fact that um, they clearly recognized the fact that uh, a newspaper handed to you in print on paper was no longer the way to go, um, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, shaking out in that industry in the very short term. And I know that everybody's expecting Mr. Mono to come out, and there's a few balloons that have been floated from starting yesterday during the weekend about what kind of funding will come to support the newspapers. I think that will not be enough to save the newspapers, but I think it will be enough for people to make some choices. Um, since you worked at the Telemedia Corporation, um how has the reporting side of uh, Canadian media changed? Um, it's all about instantaneity. I think you should ask this question again to Adrienne when she comes up in a few minutes. Um, our platforms, I mean, when I came in in 2008, there was no such thing as Instagram, Snapchat, uh, all the platforms that you guys play on every day that I actually play on every day or two. Um, in 2010, the Vancouver Olympic Games, okay, you remember that. There was no iPad. I mean, it's not like two generations ago. It's like eight years ago. So that has changed. I think that, again, l'instantanéité, this, this idea that perspective is really difficult right now when you are fighting this concept that you need to be first with news. And I think that we we have balanced our, our uh, reporting smartly because I would rather be right than first. And remember, I have no say on what's going on in the two newsrooms, but we talk about values and we talk about the importance of the, uh, of the information that we put out. And sometimes, yeah, we screw up, but most of the time we get it right. Okay, I think we're going to open up uh, questions to the audience. Um, so. Raise your hand if you have a question. Loud, please, I can, because there's some noise in the back. Yeah. That's their, that's their position. They're saying that because we are CDC, because we're funded by government, because we can take digital revenues out of our digital news platforms, we are eating their lunch and killing their model. So <laughs> there was actually a, a, a House of Commons committee, the Heritage Committee, looking at this. And when I saw this, this news, or not this news, but this courant, this, this, this idea starting to, uh, to be... Um, uh, to gaining traction, I wrote to this to the chairman Heidi Fry, and I said, "Come on, 35 million bucks." Actually, it was 30 when I wrote the letter. 30 million dollars is the revenue that we have on all of our platforms, en anglais et en français. Just about 21, 22 on, on anglais, and about eight in French. If 30 million bucks makes the whole of that industry collapse, they're in deep shoe. Okay, makes no sense. The fact is, yeah, we accelerated our, our transition because some of the choices that we had to make. And we made those choices because the financial pressures that we had at that time could not allow us to do what we, do, we did before. We shrunk um, newscasts that we had every, every evening. We went digital 18 hours a day during the weekends. 
and took out some time and resources from uh, watching um, uh, from, from news. I'll give you an example. Um, Fort McMurray fires. So I, I'm in Vancouver. I go through Edmonton. I stop to thank the team. They've been working their butts off for not 15 or 20 days. The fires have been awful. And uh, so I do a town hall. The union rep stands up and she's crying. And uh, she's saying that it's, it's, uh, it's awful, the cuts that I, I impose on that station. Um, and uh, because now they had to rely on Vancouver and Calgary to help out, they could have done this by themselves. And then you listen, you give her a hug, because obviously there's a lot of pressure at that time. And then you make her realize that um, she couldn't, and her team could not have delivered the coverage of uh, the Fort McMurray fires by themselves. It was a good thing that Vancouver and Calgary came in to help en français and anglais. The network supported that also. And then you tell her this. On a really good night in Edmonton, the nightly, the nightly news, okay, the 90 minutes that we had there before, now to, down to 30 minutes, maybe 15,000 people watch. They had 20 million hits on their website, 20 million hits on the stories they did. And Briar Stewart was the head person over there, uh, head newspaper person, or the news uh, lady, um, running all of the coverage. But you realize the importance of reach and the importance of the shift. After that, going through Edmonton, nobody, nobody puts in question or, or remet en question. The, uh, the digital shift to CVC Radio Canada. They just get it. But those are proof points, and it's getting to be somewhere. We, we think that that's the way to go. Um, the impact, and I mean, how many people here today picked up a newspaper on the way to uh, your classes this morning? A real new, oh yeah, yeah, a real newspaper, okay? How many went to your, um, to your phones today to get news? Okay, I rest my case. That's, that's why. A um, couple of more examples. I know that we're running out. Um, the ABC. Michelle Guthrie has my job in Australia. The, she replaced my best friend, Mark Scott, who I spent, I mean, eight years with as he was the head of the ABC. And I saw him also trying to shift his organization, but not as fast as we did. He didn't have the pressures, the financial pressures we had. So Michelle Guthrie now has to cut some staff in a room. So flies uh, twice now, flies our CFO, her chairman, into our boardrooms, we open our books, we show the ABC what we did. Uh, the Japanese, NHK. NHK doesn't believe that we can deliver news the way we do in the regions. Twice they've come to see what our model is. We just did Pyeongchang, where the producers of the programs that you watched were not in Pyeongchang. They were in Toronto, and in Montreal, in the third basement. We actually had sports experts and analysts and people that were describing what you thought was live in the third basement in Montreal using our technology to make you think that they're actually live on site. The BBC and NBC are scratching their head trying to figure out, okay, how can you guys actually do this? We lead the world, literally, in a number of these initiatives. And that's what the pressures that we have on us, I mean, we have great people. We are extremely resilient, but we have really smart people at CBC Radio Canada, and they figured out a way how to do it. So that's the shift. That might be all the time we have. I'm not sure. uh, we still have 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> So Bell Media recently has put forward a proposal to the CRTC called Fairplay, yep. which would enable the CRTC to block websites that are accused of uh, promoting piracy without any court oversight until uh, the appeal process. And this is something that the CDC has recently endorsed. And a lot of people are saying not only that this is a bad proposal, but that the CDC should not be in the yes. business of uh, endorsing such contentious legislation. So what would you say to people who criticize uh, that measure? The people who create content and see that content taken away and stolen, literally, by others should not be allowed to do that, and you have to pay for the content that you steal. But what about um, the need to have due process for these sites as well before they're taken down? 
So that's the, conversa that's, you, that's the conversation that we actually want the CRTC to start. That's what we want the CRTC to actually look at. And the concept of due process in everything we do is key. But right now, what is the issue? We have a whole bunch of people that are stealing content created and paid for by other people for their own benefit and their own business models, and that doesn't work. We would, like, we would like the CRTC to actually become more of a player involved in assessing the, the actions of the people that actually break the law. So we don't break the, uh, the budget this way. Um, one of the things that we did do, and I really believe in that, um, is you can't be the public broadcaster, you can't be a public broadcaster without being deeply, deeply rooted in the regions. So now what we have seen because of financial pressures, we have seen CBC and Radio Canada actually merge a number of their operations, their field operations together. I would say that about and when we did the cuts, we actually protected the regions, even though the regions don't feel that they were protected. And boy, did I hear about that. Um, to the tune of, let's say that the, the regions might get 28% of the budget, their cuts might have been 17% or 18%. So we actually overcut network, we overcut other places to try to keep some of our staff in the regions. And we didn't close, we didn't close a single station bare bones in number of stations, work their butts off in trying to make sure that we could actually deliver the content. But I really believed, and I still do today, that we, um, we need to be in the regions and we need feet on the ground because that's our job. We need to understand what Canada is all about. And you can't do this from Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver. Okay, so there's a lot in that question. Let me try to break it up. Let me, let me go to the second piece right away, indigenous issues uh, and how important we think that is. Um, not only do we have radio programs that are prime time and that deal with that, we just um, spent enormous time, of, uh, time and money uh, led by CBC at the beginning uh, in creating uh, websites en français et en anglais, Espace Autochtone en français et and, uh, CBC website. But it's not simply a website for the sake of websites. It's a, it's, a, it's a living thing now. And the conversations are ongoing and there's a programs and streaming and live so that the conversations continue. Nobody did more about missing and murdered women than we did. Uh, out of Winnipeg, the, the, the investigative unit of Winnipeg did an incredible job going back and looking at the, at the cases reopening cases. The RCMP got involved, reopened some cases because of the information we did. So uh, Cecil Rosner and the, the investigative unit out of Winnipeg did an incredible job at raising the awareness of Canadians on this issue. We took that a step further. Um, Anna, Anna Maria Tomente took her, her program, her radio program on the road, uh, town hall meetings. Again, where, uh, raising the awareness, doing some stuff in virtual reality, raising the awareness. We just invested 10 million bucks in digitization or a very important digitization project uh, to keep the culture. And we have some really old 
um, archives and we don't want to lose them. So we brought the elders in. We are working at trying to keep that. So you can, I, can, I can assure you that we understand the mandate that we have. We are the only voice up north. We, uh, we get that. Uh, and we, we talk about that openly at CBC Radio Canada. The Gameshi thing is a completely different thing. The Gameshi thing is, is something that shook us to our roots, that um, um, forced us to look at the Rubin report because the lady who investigated the Gameshi situation wrote a set of recommendations for us. And what was pretty amazing is that she didn't say that our, our policies were not good. She actually told us that our policies were very, very, very good. The problem is nobody was using them. There was a reason for, or there was some kind of blockage, and that people did not use everything we had. We had, a, we had this, um, this hotline. We, did, we had all these things. But there, there was something in our culture that prevented um, young women and men for blowing the whistle on each other or doing what they had to do to make sure that we had a safe, uh, harass-free uh, environment. So we've been working very hard on it. Do we still have issues? Will we still have issues? Yes. We are not. Um, we are aware of this, but we're working extremely hard at making sure that we try to create these environments. And on this one, the unions, the CMG, ourselves, the CRC, everybody thinks the same way. There's, uh, there's not us and, and them here. Um, uh, I created a position called the uh, Ethics Commissioner. So that's another place where you can actually go and pick up the phone and have a conversation if you think there's an issue that you will be immediately uh, taken care of. So yeah, Gameshi wasn't fun. Um, we hope to have learned from that moment. We have time for one more short question. Or if there's anything quick, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, what do you personally regard as your um, most significant achievement during your two terms as the president? So I'll answer that very quickly because I've had a question thrown at me as you know, well, these exit interviews when people th thought I was leaving in December, and then you show up in January and they say you're still there. Um, so. I think the relationship with the CMG was completely broken when I walked in. It was a, there was a very, very nasty lockout. And I think that we've reinvented the relationship. And if it wasn't for that reinvention of the relationship with the CMG, we would never have gone through all the cuts. And yeah, the unions yelled, and, but there was no lockout. There was no strike. And there's been labor peace and much more respect between the unions and ourselves. But the most important thing I think I did is I was able to manage CBC Radio Canada through some really shitty times. Um, I, no, I, I wish on no one the feeling of standing behind a microphone and telling your employees that you're taking away close to, and three times I did that, close to 3,000 jobs um, because we have great talent. And that was no fun whatsoever. And then so they want to hang you. The stuff they say about you is awful. I'm happy that my two girls who are now nine and well, 10 today, or actually tomorrow, 10 and seven, uh, didn't read the papers at that time. They were too young because if they had, they would not have been very impressed about what um, certain senior officials uh, in the union and employees of CBC Radio Canada were saying. But now it's pretty amazing because the balance, the, the pendulum has swung. We're, we've never been as watched, listened to, or read as we are now. We lead the world in a number of places, and if, if the government can help us find a way to fix the funding model, this broadcaster is in pretty good shape. It's, it's, it's I mean, you see smiles, and, and I can test it by the way I walk into an elevator. When people look at me in the eyes and they say hello, it's a good day. They were not looking at me in the eyes when I walked into the elevator from, 19, from 2013 to 2016. No way in the world. Um, we, talk, we took a challenge. Sorry, I, mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think we have to okay. cut this off now for the next few Okay. Years. So, Adrian, I'm, I'm over your time now. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. Uh, thank you for your questions. Appreciate it. <laughs>
and uh, just to add on quickly, um, we'll have our uh, keynote panel, featuring Adrian Arsenault and the third depth uh, right now. And on Wednesday at 8, uh, we'll be holding a meet and greet uh, with uh, our speakers at Gertz. Uh, come join us uh, to meet tonight's speakers and many more. And we will have free food, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't need that. I don't want that. You guys can drink it on my behalf. I'm serious. I had fun doing it. So, uh, give it to somebody else. Uh, Great answers, by the way. Got a lot of substance out of that. I appreciate it, and I have good questions.
sure. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Y'all grab your seats. Um, thank you all for coming um, for our keynote panel tonight featuring Adrian Arsenault and Deirdre Depke. Um, this is part of the, uh, this is part of the Chicken Publication Society and Daily Publication man. Society's Journalism and Media Conference. This year the theme is Journalism Redefined. How did we get here and where do we go now? Um, I'd, like to play I'd like to thank our sponsors, Montreal Press Club, Media at McGill, Cafeteria Mosaic, and David's team. We couldn't do it without them. Uh, my name is Nick Jasinski. I'm editor-in-chief of the McGill Tribune. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight with Adrian Arsenault and Deirdre Depke, as I just mentioned. Um, I have some questions prepared, but at the end I promise to leave time for questions from the audience. Um, so think of them as we go along. But before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that McGill University is situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations, a place where, which has long served as a meeting site and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. We recognize and respect these peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. Um, so a little bit more about our speakers. Adrian Arsenault is an award-winning journalist and co-host of CBC News as a National. She has worked as a senior correspondent for the National since 1999, where she has traveled the globe reporting on some of the world's most important breaking news stories, including conflicts, disasters, political crises, terror, human rights abuses, sports, and more. In 2015, she won an Emmy for her coverage of the Ebola crisis. She has also won several Gemini and Canadian Screen Awards and was named the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association's Journalist of the Year. She's covered Olympics in Sydney, Salt Lake City, Beijing, Sochi, and Rio for CBC. She's also worked as a foreign correspondent in Jerusalem and chief of the London Bureau. If it's newsworthy, breaking, and important, you can bet that Adrian is there. <laughs> um, Deirdre Defke is the senior editor and New York bureau chief for NPR's Marketplace. Deirdre began her journalism career at Business Week as a reporter covering Silicon Valley. She was named editor of that magazine's front of the book section, becoming the first woman in the role and the youngest senior editor in Business Week's history. After nearly a decade, she moved to Newsweek to serve as the magazine's foreign editor, helping to lead its award-winning coverage of China's economic modernization and the death of Princess Diana. In 2000, Deirdre helped launch Newsweek.com, an early entrance into the digital news era. In her role as editor, she managed the site's coverage of the September 11th attacks, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the disputed U.S. presidential election of 2000, among other stories. After a stint as general manager for TheWeek.com, Deirdre took over The Daily Beast, working with Tina Brown to turn the site into the prominent voice in news and opinion it remains today. Deirdre also currently serves as the president of the Overseas Press Club of America. That's a lot. Um, so. That makes me sound old. <laughs> <laughs> I should knock some of those older stories off the yeah. <laughs> Edit, edit. Yeah. Um, starting with an easy one. What is your favorite part of your job? Go for it. Uh, the best part of my job, I think, is working in an the news environment in which we're in, in the United States, which is, uh, shall we say, fast-paced and um, bizarre. It would be another adjective I would apply to it and to our president. But the result of that has been this incredible rejuvenation of journalism in the States. Um, we're now engaged in really an old-fashioned newspaper war between the Washington Post and the New York Times, which is... Exci it's exciting to be part of that news environment. My husband, who is also here, and I live in a um, 25 apartment building, you know, on the Upper West Side of New York. And for, we've gotten the paper copy of the New York Times delivered on a daily basis for the whole time we've been there, 10 years. But in the past six months, we've gotten into the habit of, he's gotten into the habit of, getting out of bed at 7 in the morning and rushing up the stairs to get to the Times before one of our neighbors steals it. <laughs> that didn't used to happen, so I know that for, as journalists, we're back. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, I, I'm envious of this New York apartment. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> I do not live in one of those. Um, but I also sort of feel that this is kind of like an intoxicating era in the business if you know, if your value is investigative journalism and truth and rolling up your sleeves and getting down to it, this is an era of bring it. Uh, the push to be transparent about what you learn and, and, you know, showing your work, you know, how you get to the stories you've got is, is actually something that I think we, we invite. Um, this, is, this is what separates uh, the posers from the people who really do the job. And... I, I think it's kind of a great time. I mean, I'm sort of in the position of, of starting something new within, a, within an organization where I've been for a long time. And all of our values have, have, are focused now on pushing the transparency and pushing context. So the show that I'm, I'm co-hosting now, The National, we've made a, con, 
a conscious decision to say, television is just a part of it, but we're guessing that if you're going to watch us at night, you probably know the Twitter version of most things that have happened during the day. So we're going to say it's not good enough for you to get a buck 30 every night, right? A, a minute 30 story, intro item, intro item, intro item, VO, 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 copy story, right? That doesn't work anymore. It's our job to say, you know what, we're going to take five of the things that matter the most and we're going to go like this on them. We're, we're going to give you more of the context of why this matters. And it's, for us, it's, you know, we're, it's still sort of we're in the first trimester of the show, if you will. Uh, so this baby's just growing, but it's kind of an exciting time for us. So that it feels new, in this era for us. The delivery mechanisms too, uh, the way we can get reach out to consumers to, of news, um, and the multiple ways we can do that. So I work in radio, but we have a vibrant digital um, presence, and we have newsletters, and we have print products, and we do events, and we speak in public, and. And I'm sure the same is true for you. So that is also, I think, sure. helped that lead to this renaissance that we're experiencing in journalism, which makes it a very good time for all of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge the journalism, in journalism industry is facing right now? Uh, for me, I think it's the same thing that, that we're both addicted to, right? It's, it's this challenge of, I, I read an article the other day from the Neiman Lab calling it the truth decay, which is like such a great headline. Uh, a, a decay in, in people's understanding of what is true. So that's both a challenge that we embrace, but it's also a challenge that is really difficult for the industry. I mean, we're in an era, and it's not just Canada, it's certainly the United States, a little bit of Western Europe, where faith in traditional sources of information is eroding. So they did, a, uh, they looked at a Gallup poll from 2000 and looked at how important it was for people to vaccinate their kids. And so in 2000, it was 64%. In 2015, it was 54%. And the doubters were younger. So the whole erosion of understanding about truth and fact has been sort of sliding in a bunch of areas, not just in journalism. So I think that's something, our relationship with facts is something mm -hmm. that, that we all kind of have to tackle. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, one of the roles of journalism is to speak truth to power. Um, and especially in the US with the Trump White House, how can journalism organizations continue to do that when power is not only not interested in the truth, but actively spreads untruth? And, and how can journalism organizations remain fair and unbiased in their coverage in that type of environment? By doing their jobs excellently, you know, and maintaining their standards in the faith, in the face of extreme prejudice and attacks and uh, refusing to buckle down, but also refusing to lower their standards. Um, so this newspaper war that I mentioned between the Times and the Post is really important because they are hyper-aggressively covering the Trump administration and the falsehoods that the administration uh, likes to promote. And by doing so, they're they're showing, I think, what journalism is really about and how to do the job correctly and uh, speaking truth to power effectively by showing how weak power is and how weak power's message is is a fantastic way to start. I would, I would just say it's not just something for us to observe as sort of slightly smug neighbors, because you know that happens, mm -hmm. right, a little bit. Um, we're not so innocent in, in this as a country. Our, our press freedom is, is, we have a problem. The World Press Freedom Index ranks Canada as number 22 on the list in 2017. That was a drop of four points. And you know, this is not an era of openness, despite what this current government has promised and said. Uh, disclosure rates are down for access to information. Some of the rules are getting tighter. We don't have protections for whistleblowers. And without whistleblowers, uh, democracy would be in big, big trouble. So if we don't want to be complacent uh, as Canadians and as journalists, then we're going to have to fight really hard and get very noisy about protecting the existing press freedoms and, and pushing for more openness. Because a country like this one uh, probably deserves a lot more openness than it has. In my role as, um, at the Overseas Press Club, one of my jobs is to um, engage with journalists from around the world and help them fight the 
fight this fight as well. Um, and I think that's another important thing that we can all do, which is realize that none of us are working independently, completely independently. We're all working for the betterment of the profession. And in many cases, sadly, we're working to keep uh, our colleagues alive yeah. in conflict zones where there are few protections, where, to be honest, our employers have basically uh, contracted out coverage in conflict, conflict zones to untrained young people like yourselves, freelancers who don't have resources, they don't have health insurance, they don't have, <coughs> they don't have anybody to help them out if something goes wrong. So that's one of the key roles too that I think we can play is really uh, collaborating to strengthen the individual in the field and elsewhere. We, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you followed it, but in, in this province we had a, a situation where the police were executing warrants and, and taking the phone records of journalists so that they could find their confidential sources. This is a fight worth fighting, right? Like, if you're going to get mad about something, this is a fight worth fighting. And, and a number of Canadian organizations, Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, for example, have pushed really hard to get some accountability for this because nothing puts a chill on a source who actually has real information that, that people deserve to know than believing that the cops are actually stealing the contacts off the phones of the journalists. This, this is, you don't have to go that far from home to see trouble. Um, so Adrian, you mentioned the role of whistleblowers. Um, in, recent year, in recent years, the role of online information leaks, the websites like yep. LegalLeaks and, and other sources, um, have received increased attention in the media, both in the US and in Canada. Um, how should journalists handle information from these types of sources? Wow, it's such a good question. Um, I was really lucky a couple weeks ago to go speak, spend some time, spend a day with Daniel Ellsberg. Do you know this name? So he was a leaker of the Pentagon Papers. He's amazing, right? He's 86 years old. Upstairs, his wife has his bookcase, and you know the sunbeams hit it, and it's the history of love and the story of the heart. And then down below, under the house, are all his documents and books so wow. that are all categorized like lies, torture, <laughs> catastrophe <laughs> secrets. And so she has gone in there with her friends and their incense and they try to wipe the spirits away, but, but he gets locked under there with all That's his great. documents. It's an amazing <laughs> scene. But he says that he's afraid that in this era, if someone were to, were to get a stash of documents like he had with the Pentagon Papers, that people would not believe it. And this terrifies him. So uh, how do you handle it? You handle it with care. You verify, verify, verify. I mean, this is fact-checking and verification units. Used to be the dona domain of something called Snopes. Basically, Snopes was the only one doing it. Now there's like 150 really credible fact-checking organizations. And you better bloody well be right. You know, I think there was an era where you could trust if somebody hands you a document, you sort of trust that it's legit. Um, we can't, mm -hmm. we can't be sure anymore. You have to be really careful before you publish. And being open to that collaboration yeah. and working as part of a team is key, I think, in dealing with whistleblowers. I'm blanking on the latest leaks, which were the documents about the um the reality winner <laughs> no no oh, her her she, yeah she was the leaker you know her in the states her na actual name is reality winner um <laughs> but um teams thousands of journalists around the world all collaborated fact checking Panama. Panama papers, Panama papers, Panama. Right. Yeah. thank you thousands of journalists around the world collaborated to fact check those documents and to report on them and that's a really important lesson i think too once again that you know none of us really are operating alone well, on the collaboration, there's something I think we're all doing in our writing that's a little bit different from before. And I was joking about showing your work, but it is kind of, there is a lot more of that. Here's how we got to this conclusion. So there was a story in The National last night about the uh, Jacob Hogard from Headley. And so they broke a story out of the Ottawa Bureau about a woman who came forward saying that she'd had this terrible en encounter with him. And so the reporter said, look, she did not go to the police. So how do we know what we know? Well, we know it from a, a few ways. One of them is a medical report. She went to the doctor. Here it is. This is what the doctor said. There was an era, I think, where, where journalists would say, trust us, we know. Right. It's done. Right? Then forget it. So you're only going to trust us if we can show you what we know, and then you can evaluate along with us 
you know, the, the truth of it. We have to be way more transparent and accountable in, in the mechanism of writing as well. Um, with so many potential stories on the international scene, as head of your newsrooms, how do you choose which stories to highlight to, to viewers, to listeners, to readers? Um, and are there any major stories that you feel aren't adequately covered in the mainstream media today? Well, um, my charge is right now is a little bit narrower in the job that I'm doing, which is we have a, a very specific mandate, which is to raise the economic intelligence of the American public. Um, we think that democracy uh, and accountability is, is increased if people understand the relationship between money and government. So that's what we're working on every day, day after day after day. So we, every story that we do, we ask ourselves this question, um, which is, can, will a story about this topic actually lead to people understanding better how government and how money works? Um, and if we can't say that, yes, we can do it within the confines of the show, or it doesn't really matter if they understand, if, you know, if we present this information, then um, we move on. I think staying focused on your mission is a key thing. I'm also, this is one of the few places I've worked where that actually had a mission. <laughs> I mean, journalists are notoriously bad managers, um, and editors are notoriously bad at communicating leadership strategy. I think uh, this is something that we all have to really improve um, so that we're really, we're all clear about where we're marching along and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and hopefully a new generation of editors will, will be better at that. No one's ever accused me of being in charge of anything, so <laughs> that's a huge relief. I don't have to make these decisions, but I can tell you it is like a, a kind knockdown brawl every day, several times a day. Everybody's sort of fighting their corners uh, in our meetings in a very polite Canadian way, but, um, but definitely advocating for what matters. So for me, I'm the voice in the room that's screaming, Yemen, Yemen, you know, yeah. why aren't we spending more time talking about Yemen? or the ethics of algorithms. I am obsessed with the, with the hidden biases in, in the math of the algorithms that run our lives. I, it's the sort of thing that really freaks me out. Climate refugees, like dear God, we need to spend more time talking about the m massive movement of people across this earth when they simply cannot continue to live where they currently live. So these are the stories that I'll fight for. Rosie Barton in Ottawa, if you've seen Rosie, you know, Rosie is a pit bull in heels who will take on hypocrisy and corruption and political, you know, shenanigans like nobody's business. So uh, we all fight our corners, and that's why we cannot be in charge of anything. It would just be, it would be terrible. On a general basis, I think we need to do a better job of figuring out how to tell the stories of human atrocities mm -hmm. in a way that it's not just the oh, here's the Syria story, the Yemen story, the Myanmar story of the day. You know, you, you, what we're doing is, by presenting the information the way we have been, it narcotizes the audience a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, it's still going on in Syria. I mean, if you were really, if you spent a minute in Syria, it would be much, you'd have a much different perspective. But of course, that's not possible. So how can we communicate right. those stories without making them commodity? Well, I mean, I, th I, I think that's a, you're absolutely right, and that's, a, that's an obsession. I mean, I, I argue you don't get it until you go, right? And, right. and as you're right, you, not everybody can go, so it's my job, like I was in Raqqa in October in, in Syria, it's my job to say if, if I can't bring you all with me, I will still bring you all with me, right? You know, that must have been an incredible experience. It was, it was totally fascinating. I, I, I mean, people have names, right? They're not just... The, the horrible thing that happens when you cover conflict is you might hear a person's voice. Who are they? How old are they? What's their name? You would afford that courtesy to someone at home, you know? Afford it to someone over there. Uh, people have stories. They have a range of emotions. You have to be able to convey to people what it smells like to stand there and to stand in Raqqa at that time. Believe me, it had a scent. Um, what it sounds like, what the sound of things that are incoming and outgoing, what's the difference between those sounds. If I, if I can borrow you, whether it's digitally or, or uh, on television, and just for a moment have you feel it, then I think we can help convey these foreign stories and make them not so foreign. I saw an incredible art exhibit last year in New York in which a photographer had 
taken um, lines of refugees in Syria, I believe, and uh, digitally altered the photos so that they, instead of wearing the dress that they w were wearing there, they put them in basically clothes that Western, yeah. Westerners wear. Uh, so jeans and t-shirts and sweatshirts and hoodies. And, and it became such a transformative thing to look at that photo and picture yourself and your neighbor rather than a culture halfway around the world that you don't really understand yep. and what is the, you know, it just it humanized it. So we need to somehow do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So when you cover stories like that that are emotionally difficult, um, how do you deal with the impact your work might have on your well-being? Uh, well, to me, the hardest story that I covered um, with real depth was 9-11. And um, mm -hmm. I had a two-year-old daughter at the time. Uh, I was in my office, you know, for three, four, five days, pretty much straight. Um, coming home in the middle of the night, changing clothes, going back. Uh, and looking at photos, basically all the raw footage and photos sort of ended up on my desk and I had to choose what pictures we were going to use and what sound we were going to use, what stories we were going to tell. And a lot of it was not something that you could make publicly available. It was just too violent and upsetting. And on the fifth day or sixth Sunday morning, I we were done finally with, I think we did three copies of Newsweek and updated the website 5,000 times. Um, and I was done and I was going to have the day off and I went home. My mother was there taking care of my daughter because my husband is also a journalist and he was at his office doing the same thing. And I thought, I'm going to go have a manicure. That will make me feel better. And instead, as I was walking to the nail salon, I saw a church, the Catholic church in my neighborhood. And I thought, you know what, I'll just duck in here and see what's going on. It was packed. I mean, this church has never been packed before or since that first Sunday after 9-11. And I stood in the back and just collapsed, you know, like literally sobbing, um, and couldn't couldn't stand up and couldn't leave. And people around me, strangers, took care of me for a while. And after that, I had to go get counseling. I mean, in a, for a long a long time, it it took me a long time. I couldn't drive down the New Jersey Turnpike and look at the skyline without crying. Um, and I think you just have to recognize when that happens to you, and you know deal with it in a, a professional and efficient way. <laughs> uh, and realize that there's no shame in it. I mean, the, what you talk about looking at, at pictures, it's, you were also living there, but right. but looking at pictures we've come to learn is a really a triggering thing for a lot of editors uh, who maybe have never been to the conflict zone or in some cases haven't left their office and it, it scars them. And I, I think at, at CBC it's something we have to talk about when we got back from Raqqa, I, I had to sit down with the editor and say, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna start to ingest this stuff and I need you to know what's on it and, and where you're gonna have trouble and if you need to take some time, uh, let's do that. So that's something we're learning about. It's an interesting industry because, you know, the suck it up buttercup thing is, is real. Um, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna talk about feeling traumatized because you're scared that they're not going to send you out next time. Yeah. You know, you can say no once, probably not twice, is, is sort of the culture that, that we've all grown up in. So, um, I didn't talk about that with anyone. No, of course not, right? In, my, in the office. I don't even know if I talked about it at home, but, um, yeah, and I never would. I mean, no, you, you can't. You couldn't. I, I say mm -mm. can't. I think you probably could now. I don't know. Yeah. Would you? Well, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I've, I, I think the beauty in working in, in television, uh, primarily, even though it's digital. <laughs> Uber, I hear you. Digital first. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but largely, we go out with television cameras. So there's usually a couple of us. And that is, that is your family. You know, when you're covering Ebola, you're in a conflict zone, or I mean, any range of crazy things. Um, you talk it out with each other, and then you have the chance to write about it. And this is like so healthy. If you have so many platforms, I, my Insta story and my Twitter story, and my Facebook, <laughs> it's really cleansing. I mean, I, there are lots of old journalists, let's say, people who are in their 
80s now who talk about when they would cover like the Vietnam War and they would have one outlet, like one platform, a two minute and 30 second television story. And they had seen so much. Like where did all that stuff go? It, it went into a bottle sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, it went into some bad field behavior and it went into books. Um, I think went we- the yeah, bad field behavior. Yeah. We, we get to sort of purge it onto the, onto the various pages a little, a little bit. My father was a journalist in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he worked for the daily newspaper there. And I remember very clearly, I was maybe six or seven, um, the police came to our house one night <laughs> and loaded the entire family. I had three brother, three sis two sisters and a brother, loaded all of us at 11 o'clock at night into the back of a police car and drove us to this motel where we had to live for uh, a week. To us, this was exciting because we were living in a motel and I had a pool. And it was the middle of winter in Cleveland, Ohio. But the, rea but the reality was that my father had published a story about the mafia uh, in Cleveland and there was a contract out on him. So all this is, you know, years later as an adult, I said my father had died, but I said to my mother, wasn't dad scared? And she said, I have no idea, he never mentioned it. Right. Like, that was how, yeah. I ne he never mentioned it, I don't know. But do you ever get scared when reporting? And what do you do to overcome it? I'm a giant chicken. I am telling you right now, I have been shot at. I have been arrested. I have been punched. I have been dragged. And I am scared all the time. Um, that's just at the office. No. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what? Yes, I absolutely. And if you're not scared, you all need to go home. Uh, because there's something wrong. But. The interesting thing about being in the field is that it's a series of little tiny baby steps. Do I feel safe enough getting in the car? Driver okay, the tires are okay, yeah, I feel good. Do I feel safe enough if we take this road? Yep, that feels good. So it's a series of decisions you make one after another and then one foot in front of the other, next thing you know you're there. And you have to promise yourself that you can't be allowed to be afraid, like legit afraid until something is right in front of you. And we train for this. We we do hostile environment courses like Absolutely. you would not believe. The they are training, great. Yeah. The training is really important. And um, if you're ever, if this is your ambition to get out into the field, to report overseas, you must, 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 must. do hostile reporting training. And it's available for free. The Overseas Press Club of America is yeah. a good resource for it. I'm sure there are Canadian organizations that also offer it. Do it. If you don't, you're literally playing Russian roulette with your life. And it's not worth it. And it will tell you something about yourself, that you can have a quiet, private conversation with yourself. If you're in a kidnapping scenario at these courses where they literally, you're minding your own business and they put a bag over your head and throw you to the ground and shove you in a car, if, if in that scenario situation you have a, that conversation where, where you say to yourself, I know this could be real and you know what, it's not for me, oh, it's okay, you know, yeah. like embrace it, take it, you don't have to do that. You don't, you don't have to be that person who, who goes there. Um, you know, if you want to find, give voice to people who don't have voices or, or shed light, you don't have to go far from home to do that. And if you're not comfortable with the idea of somebody throwing a bag over your head and throwing a car, you don't have to do it. Okay. So these courses are great for like a little reality gut check. check. Yeah. Um. Changing gears a bit, I have some statistics for this one. Um, a 2015 Pew study found that 38% of reporters and writers and 35% of newsroom supervisors were women. Um, a statistic that has shown little improvement since a similar study was conducted in 1994, which found that only 25% of journalism professionals were women. And where's this? Um, that was from Pew. In the States? Yes. Um, so two questions about that. Do you think that the underrepresentation of women in the industry affects news coverage? Um, and do you see a change happening now? Maybe alongside the Me Too movement and um, re related things happening? Well, I work at a, an organization which uh, I'm astonished by this fact. Of eight senior managers, seven are women, and five are women of color. So I happen to work at a company where diversity and gender equity is a, is a priority. On the other hand, I live in New York, 
and the Times is my primary news source. Uh, and the Times has had one woman as its editor, and they drove her out in 11 months. And, you know, that's not an accident. <laughs> that newsroom was not prepared to deal with uh, female leadership, and they united against her. And I'm sure she had her faults, but, you know, most Times editors have been uh, t tremendous assholes. So the, this woman, there was no way that she topped the, um, the treachery that the, her predecessors were engaged in. So um, do, is it changing? Mm, no, not so much. <laughs> I mean, but some organizations have a commitment to it, and I think you can find, you can find those and uh, be a part of that. Or you can get inside organizations like the Times and work to change them. And someday it will, yeah. I think CBC, I, I know CBC has a strong commitment. I mean, I'm one of four co-hosts. Uh, two of us are women. Our executive producer is a woman. The chief news editor at CBC is a woman. I mean, we are uh, there. Our, we are loud. We are proud. Um, we are at the table, not sitting in the chairs along the back wall in a, in a boardroom. So. Uh, Underrepresentation of a lot of voices, not just women, has been an issue for all sorts of newsrooms, which yeah. are still very white, right? They're, they're still very white. This is I'm kind of surprised to hear that 38% number because yeah, I feel like it's we're doing better than that yeah. um, in That's most major I'm media. Suspicious. Show your work. Yeah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but if you really so. wanted to get it into <laughs> diversity, it's the whiteness. Yeah, it's so it's appalling. Yeah. And many newsrooms are just completely white. And uh, there it seems to be less commitment to changing that than there needs to be. Uh, in CBC's defense, I would say there is a massive commitment. Yeah. And, and I think it's reflected not just in staffing, but in active storytelling. Um, no, we're not 100% there yet. No. You'd be goofy to try to, to claim otherwise. But I can tell you the commitment is is strong and I, and I see it represented every day. Um, you know, certainly, I know we were talking about the Indigenous unit earlier. I mean, I, if you haven't spent time on the CBC Indigenous site and it's all various platforms, you really should because in this country, I mean, Lex and I were talking about this, newspapers don't have what, what, one, there is one. Well, there's only one Wow. According to McLean's, right? Not good. There are 10 full-time Indigenous reporters <coughs> at CBC. The CBC Indigenous Unit is a huge undertaking. Um, and, you know, March 19th, they are releasing something called Beyond 94, which is supposed to be the definitive digital source, that number, 94, right? 94 recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The digital uh, source for what is this recommendation? What's the status of it? Where, where did it come from? How is it going? So that you can check in. These are sort of, this is something that CBC really believes in, and uh, this unit is one to watch because their investigative journalism is What's outstanding. The March 19th. I want to cover that. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, what is your favorite story you've covered? Favorite in a good or a bad way? Yeah, it's kind of good. <laughs> most, most impactful, most. Uh, Important to you personally? Well, 9 11 was, there just was nothing. I mean, just the trauma and the disaster, uh, I think that's pretty obvious. But the second one I will say <laughs> was um, a slightly different, which is Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. So uh, Monica Lewinsky broke on a Saturday uh, on something called the Dredge Report. But Dredge had actually access to the reporting that Newsweek had done and was trying to, d was debating about how to expose it. Um, so I was the new editor of something called this website, which nobody, no, no one even knew what a website really was and Newsweek management. But um, when Drudge went with the story, they suddenly all, the top editors appeared in my office and said, can you like send this to the internet so people can see <laughs> what we have? And I said, yes, I can. And so we had it posted um, within minutes and it was the moment where I think the recognition of the power of digital reporting 
became clear to everyone uh, at my news organization and basically to everyone who was a news consumer. And that was a really empowering and exciting moment. And you told me about this before. Where, where were you when that uh, story broke? Well, so I had spent tons of time preparing for what was supposed to be a gigantic news story. It was Pope John Paul II was going to Cuba. <laughs> and this was going to be this big rapprochement between the Catholic Church and uh, Cuba and Castro. And so everyone was on the plane, on the tarmac, sitting there waiting to get out to greet the Pope and to see Castro. When the, at that time it was Blackberries, the Blackberries started buzzing. Bzz, 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 bzz. No one got off the planes. The planes just turned around and went back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor Pope got very little coverage of his historic trip to Cuba. I don't have a story that good. Um, I, uh, I for, well, for me, 2014, uh, the Ebola crisis in Liberia was was uh, that was a big story to cover. Um, wow. It was a big decision for the network, in part because our insurer, um, I, our insurer said, uh, "So here's the thing: uh, <laughs> if they get sick, we're not flying them back." Just so you know. Wow. So we had to say, are you still willing to go? And we said, yeah. And CBC said, oh, okay, so here are the rules. Uh, don't get sick. Uh, don't get sick. It's okay. Were and they going to fly you back? You know, we were going to worry about that later. Um, and the thing with, with Ebola is that um, if you have a fever, for any reason, the perception is that you have Ebola, and so then you'll be put in, in one of those camps mm -hmm. where you will probably get Ebola, right. right? So don't get a fever, don't get sick, have a good time, come back. Um, oh, and by the way, when you come back, you're not allowed into the CBC or home for 21 days. You're going to be in quarantine. Uh, so we were obsessed with our own baloney, you know. Oh, so if you're bleaching your hands and then you touch the car handle, do you have to bleach the car handle too? And you take your temperature three times a day and send it into the CBC, like what they were going to do about it, I don't know. Um, we weren't allowed to eat. We had to bring our own food because they couldn't control the food supply. And then CBC sent us with um, meal rations, close your ears, Uber, and they were expired, meal <laughs> rations. And if you know anything about military rations, they last for like a decade. So these were really old. Oh, that's awful. Um, so there's that kind of stuff, and so you're you're you know you're up in your own head, and then you get there, and you just think I am a horrible human. You know I have all the bleach in the world and all the education in the world about this, and look at these people. You know so Liberia is this country where people are so loving and and touching each other is so important, and no one was touching. People weren't shaking hands because if you loved somebody enough to sort of wipe the sweat from their brow. Ebola was going to get you next. So people were sort of like touching elbows. That was the most they would do. And I've been in a lot of conflict and disaster zones. I've never been anywhere so quiet in my life. Like this, this people were so ill that it was, it was literally deathly quiet. Mm. Um, and they were more afraid and more generous with us than we deserved them to be. So it was kind of an honor to be there. Um, and it was hard to leave, and then, you know, being trapped inside for 21 days like a caged animal was Where'd annoying. you go? We, w so we were put in a condo across the street from CBC, <laughs> um, but not allowed in the building, and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so before I turn over to questions from the audience, do you have any advice for young people hoping to break into the journalism industry? <laughs> Do your conflict training. Yes. Uh, find an organization that can hook you up with potential employers and create a network for yourself. The Overseas Press Club um, has student memberships that I think are ten dollars or something. Uh, it's worth. We have a private network that uh, assigns um, editors and journalists and hooks them up to each other. So if we need a story done out of Montreal. A Deciding editors can look at this list and say, oh, the, here's a nice promising student at McGill, maybe, you know, so get yourself a network yeah. um, and read everything you can. I, I, I would echo that particularly about the training and the, you don't have to go it alone, 
learn about insurance, learn about freelance networks that you can become a part of, uh, because there are lots of journalists in trouble out there and no one's coming for them. So we need to make sure that we need to know to come for you, because we will, right? Networks, we will, we will throw everything we have to, to help out journalists, but we need to know you're there. And I would say for your own craft, you know, the, the joke about being right or first, there is a, a network in the UK, I won't name them because I love them, but their slogan used to be, first for breaking news, and we'd all say, and never wrong for long, <laughs> you know, because they were constantly being corrected. So learn, the, learn how to verify. It, it's one thing to say it's important to do it, but learn how to do it. Embrace data journalism, numbers, are facts and facts are your friends and facts will win at the end of the day. I mean, science uses them, sports uses facts, technology uses facts. Why can't politics? You know, they can. We just have to demonstrate their power again and, and learn how to tell a story. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be the best at whatever piece of tech you've got, but I promise you, you're gonna go to lunch and you're gonna come back and the tech will have changed. So it's, it's more important that, that you really understand the arc of storytelling so that people can care about all this great work you're gonna do. Any questions? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm not religious, but I've made a lot of packs with a higher power of sorts that I, I, I'm so sorry I've got myself in the situation. Look, I, I um, yeah, you know, being scared is okay. It's okay to be scared. And I really mean it when I say there's something wrong with you if you're not afraid. Uh, and being reckless is, is a terrible thing, so being afraid is, is good. I, I've been... I was very scared in Zimbabwe at one point. We were, I'm not gonna tell it like an old person, like war story, but um, <laughs> we were in a car with a, a, a driver, lovely man named Fortune. And it was my mistake that forgetting to realize that Fortune wanted to make us happy as opposed to answering a question directly. So when I said to Fortune, is it okay to go to this part of a cemetery? He said yes. It really wasn't okay. There was an opposition part of a cemetery and a ZANU PF, which is the Mugabe's men, part of the cemetery. We went into the wrong one. And there were a bunch of guys who were drunk, who were digging uh, graves with machetes. They saw us, they surrounded the car, they took the keys out of the car, they pulled all of us out of the vehicle, and they were telling us that all these graves were for us. Mm. And we had no power at all. Another truck comes and they pull us further away from each other. Ah, so angry with myself, so upset. We only got out of there because uh, a government minister was at a funeral, happened to see what was happening, realized very quickly that they were gonna kill us and managed to convince them, I don't know how he did it really, to, to hand us over to his custody and we'd get really in trouble. And so he came and threw the keys in the car and said, just drive. And so we beetled it out of there. And you know, sometimes bad things happen when you don't expect them to. And sometimes when you're really expecting bad things to happen, as in Syria, everything's fine. So it's important to trust your team, trust, sound like an ethic, trust in your training. Um, you know, trust, trust the training you've been through and trust that it's worth it to take each step. Time to, yeah, sure. By finding the narrative tale, the personal story inside the scientific story. So if um, there was, the Times did a great piece the other day about rising floodwaters in South Carolina or something, and how these centuries old communities are being forced to leave their homes. Um, it was a very effective way of conveying, you know, these are people who have never gone beyond the borders of their state. Um, many of them are African Americans. Mm -hmm. They've 
descendants of slaves, and suddenly the water is up to their eaves and they have to move. They have nowhere to go. They have no expectation that they'll be able to recover anything for the rest of their lives. That really, to me, drove home the climate change message. So everything relatable. Relatable, a narrative, the, the people inside the story. And experiential reporting isn't, isn't soft reporting. Right? Like, right, like sometimes you will hear people say, well, that's a bit featurey, you know, the story about the kid who can't go to school because the rivers flow. It's not, you know, in the right context, in, in partnership with the facts, it's, its function is to be relatable. If somebody wants to call that soft, that's actually their problem. Uh, it, but it's relatable, I think, really matters. Yeah. Questions? dragged to meetings, three or four meetings in a day, and the passion rapidly loses, leaves the room, you know? <laughs> Budget meetings and human resources, and oh god, we just did this hour and a half training on computer security that had nothing to do with anything. Yeah, uh, but then you get back to the story. And really, I often tell myself, like, what would I rather, is there something I'd rather mm -hmm. be doing? And I can't think of a single thing. Except maybe a small independent bookstore in a speech town. <laughs> <laughs> That's your weekend. But that'll be yeah. that'll be for later. <laughs> I, I think probably. I mean, we've known each other for all of twelve minutes now. But uh, I'm guessing from listening to Deirdre that that there's a there's a brain chemistry thing that's similar, which is that um, every even though it's the same job, same industry, every single day is totally different from the one before, and that is. That's what's kind of intoxicating, is that you know the story takes you where it feels like taking you. And if you're in a position to go with it, it is incredible. I oh, mean, it's so awesome. It, you, you cannot make this stuff up. I mean, uh, the president may think you can, but you cannot <laughs> actually make this stuff up. And it is like a total joy to surf it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, listen, this is, if you guys are, this school is amazing, by the way. You don't have a journalism program, but you have this, this sort of interest and energy around journalism that places you, I think, so far ahead of people who would come to something like this because they're in a journalism oh, program. Oh, completely right. Journalism degrees are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, go get one if you want, but yeah. make sure you find a cheap one because they're not worth, you know, Columbia, the 150000 for the Columbia the Advanced MS. Yeah. Um, MS I'll tell you right now, down the street is CUNY, the City University of New York, and it'll cost you 25000 and it's much better. But anyway, uh, you know, understanding science mm -hmm. or economics or health or literature or political science or history is so much more important to your job as a journalist than, you know, some training that you, you got it in some journalism program. I mean, sometimes it's a passport. You know, yeah. like sometimes a journalism degree is like literally a stamp and a passport that gets you in the front door. And that's important, right? And you learn that about ethics and, and you know, law, that all of that is really important. And sometimes there are other places where you might not get that. So I, I like don't totally toss out the possibility, but the fact that you're here um, of your own free will, I presume, uh, <laughs> says a lot about your futures, I, I, I think. I do a lot of hiring and I look for experience. So if you have internships if you're writing for the Tribune. I can teach you the other stuff if I have to, you know. good. I don't hire anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that you were both talking about um, how the, the issue that's being less addressed in workplaces is not about women's equality or um, women's representation or racial representation. That made me think a bit about the conversation about truth to power. Um, so I was just wondering how, in both of your jobs, you try to um, push not only truth to power in the sense that people might be thinking about it in terms of the Trump administration or governments, but even challenging people's more
more subtle assumptions? Well, it's an everyday thing, right? Uh, I mean, firstly, CBC has this uh, diversity leadership program where people uh, are, are selected or voted by their peers and then they go into a leadership training program and then they go back to their different units and try to lead on story selection. So it's an interesting approach and it works. I, you know, the, it's a language thing sometimes. You know, I had a long conversation with the folks from CBC Indigenous the other day. I said, what, what drives you crazy about news coverage right now? And you and I were talking about this earlier. Is one of the things that was driving them crazy is they kept hearing people talk about the Colton Bushy trial. No, he's dead, right? It's not, this boy isn't on trial. He's the victim. It's the Gerald Stanley trial, right? And it's, it's sloppy language like that that needs to be challenged um, every single day. And it's just being made aware sometimes of the importance of challenging that. It's not the only thing, but it's, it's one of those things that can get overlooked. Well, an editor I had um, many years ago once told me that if somebody brings an objection to you about an angle or language or a story idea because of its um, potential to offend, you need to listen right away. Because your first instinct is, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. If somebody feels that way, it's not ridiculous and you need to be sensitive to it. You need to think about it. And maybe you'll go ahead, but you have to then think about how you're going to go ahead in a, with an approach that's going to account for the sensitivity. And, and explore where, where that objection is coming from. Like, what's right. the essence? Is it the language around the script? Is it the, the choice of the location for the interview? Is it the, the choice of the people being interviewed? What, yep. wh what's happening there? Right? Like really, there's a lot of listening that has to happen. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank for being you for here. having us. <laughs> more events tonight, a panel coming up right now about um, activism and reporting, and then a lecture later on about integrity and reporting and bulletproofing stories before sending them out. Um, two more days of the conference as well, Wednesday night, Good Mixer time. at Gertz starting at 8 o'clock.
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out to this panel on art and activism. This is part of the Tribune Publication Society and the Daily Publication Society's Journalism and Media Conference. The theme this year is Journalism Redefined, How Did We Get Here and Where Do We Go Now? And this conference is sponsored by the Montreal Press Club, Media at McGill, Cafeteria La Mosaic, and David's Tea. My name is Emma, and I'm a managing editor at the McGill Tribune. Today we'll be speaking with Cyrus Marcus Ware, Yasmin Juani, and Natalie Childs. Um, and this panel will last one hour, and we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So before we begin, I, we'd like to acknowledge that McGill, Univer McGill University is situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations, a place which has long served as the site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples. We recognize and respect these peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands on waters on which we meet today. So now a bit more of information about our speakers. Cyrus Marcus Ware is a Vanier scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks and black activist culture. His works have been shown widely at galleries, universities, and festivals across Canada. He's part of the Performance Disability Art Collective, um, as well as the Black Triangle Arts Collective, a visual arts collective dedicated to exploring disability and racial and economic <coughs> justice. Cyrus is also co-curator of The Cycle, a two-year um, disability arts performance initiative at the National Arts Center. He is a facilitator and designer at the BAMP Center, and was the coordinator of the Art Gallery of Ontario's youth program for 12 years. Cyrus was the inaugural Daniel Spectrum Artist in Residence in 2016-2017. Cyrus is a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. He's also part of Blackness Yes, Blockerama. Presently, he's working on a PhD at York University in the Department of Environmental Studies. Yasmin Juwani is a full professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Concordia University. She's the author of Discourses of Denial, Mediations of Race, Gender, and Violence, as well as co-editor of Girlhood, Redefining the Limits, and Faces of Violence in the Lives of Girls. Her work has appeared in a wide variety of journals and anthologies. Her research interests include mediations of race, gender, and violence in the press, as well as representations of women of color in popular media. She's currently the Concordia University Research Chair in Intersectionality, Violence, and Resistance. And Natalie Childs is a managing editor of Guts Canadian Feminist Magazine. Since 2013, Guts has been a volunteer-run online magazine and blog that provides a forum for furthering feminist discourse, criticism, and thought in Canada. Guts publishes essays, reviews, journalism, interviews, fiction, poetry, and new media by new and emerging writers and artists who are underrepresented in the Canadian media landscape. In her day job, Natalie works on a farm in Hemingford, Quebec. So I'm now going to turn it over to the speakers themselves to explain a little bit more about how they got to where they are now and what they do. Cyrus, would you like to start? <laughs> sure, uh, my name is Cyrus. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a visual artist um, and an activist, and I got involved in both art and activism as a child. I was really uh, encouraged by my parents to get uh, involved in art making because I have a lot of artists in my family. Um, so I was lucky that way. Uh, and activism and social justice was sort of built into our family structure. So from a very young age, I was always mixing those two things together. Um, I have, I'm involved in a lot of different things as you heard from my bio. And primarily the way that I sort of structure my life is that everything kind of feeds into itself. So my art practice explores black activist culture. My activism uses a lot of creative practice and, and art as part of um, its sort of movement building. And then my scholarship is exploring the experiences of disabled artists of color in contemporary art environments. So they all kind of feed into each other. Um, and somewhere in that, I also am a parent of a really great six-year-old. And yeah, so, and an identical twin. Wow. <laughs> well, I can't top that. <laughs> so I'm going to take it somewhere else. How did I get into this? I think that's a, uh, 
That's a really good question, and it's a it's a it's one of the things that is a good entryway into storytelling because this is what it's all about. So this story, for me, in terms of my involvement in the press and the interventions that I've done. Um, in terms of journalism, actually came about with a lot of the work that I was doing on anti-racism in British Columbia um, some 30 years ago. So I'm going to date myself. I'm ancient. Um, and at that time, we had an organization called the Committee for Racial Justice, which was also monitoring the media to see how, in fact, the media representations of people of color was feeding into and fueling the kind of racism that people of color were encountering. So that was my first sort of avenue into this work. And then from there it became a matter of how, um, how one could leverage the power of the media to change the story. How could one add nuances to it? How could one make an intervention that would actually work in the favor of those who are marginalized? So from that perspective, a lot of the work that I've done on different platforms and different media has been around that. How do we tell the story differently? And how do we tell the story from the margins as opposed to the story that's being told from the center? So I'll stop there and turn it over. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a ma managing editor of Guts, which was started in 2013 by two of my friends, Nadine and Cynthia. Um, they just finished their master's degrees and were sort of looking for a place to make more public some of the conversations that they felt that they were having with their communities and their peer groups, but also conversations that they felt I think were missing from like the, acad <laughs> the academic um, programs yeah. that they were involved in. Um, so that's sort of the genesis and then our editorial board has shifted um, over time and I think our understanding of what feminism is has really shifted throughout that time, um, and that's really thanks to and like a reflection of the writers that we've published and the artists that we've worked with, as well as our readers and the feedback that we've gotten. So that's been a really interesting evolution. Um, and I just wanted to like clarify that we are not like I feel a little like we're not journalists, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily the framework that we work in, and so. Um, yeah, the, the idea of like creating conversation and space is, mm -hmm. is more how we see our role. Yeah, thank you. Um, so each of you draw attention to marginalization and promote social justice through various different mediums. Um, what kinds of social change do you hope to create through your activism and how do your respective fields um, help you achieve those goals or how does the platform you use impact your message? Can I? Just jump in, and because yeah. I want to follow up with what you said, and this is supposed to be like a conversation, which yeah. is the best thing you could do, right? Uh, we're not journalists, but one of the things that we are, are, I would say, media gorillas, if you want, right? Uh, because in changing the story, the critical thing for me, and this is one of the reasons why I studied the news so much, uh, even though many of my peers thought it was a very boring genre, um, was because if I wanted to make an intervention, I needed to see how the news was ideologically coding something. And that became really important to me. So in, in looking at the news and doing a critical news analysis, one of the things that became very apparent to me are things that journalists usually take for granted in terms of the stock and trade of how to tell stories. But that stock and trade, which they take for granted, and which is very much a part of the newsroom culture, for us from the outside becomes a way in which we can unpack and see where are the little spaces of resistance that we can insert our stories, our perspectives in. So for me, the news was like, in looking at the news, it was like, okay, what's the ideological code here? And the code was one of a binary. And binaries are the best way that ideology works, the most powerful way. But the binary isn't always explicit. It's usually implicit. So by portraying something that's bad, you're left with a, a sense, an implicit sense of what's good, right? A, a, a classic example is stories about uh, rape, for instance. You know, in the past have been stories about these young women who have unfortunately found themselves being raped or victims of rape. And so the question becomes, 
for the, in terms of the way the story is written, for the audience, well, why was she where she was? Or what did she do to elicit this kind of behavior? So that's the kind of sort of implicit, explicit ways in which that code is working, where we automatically, implicitly know what a good woman does and what a not good woman does. So I wanted to add that to this, to this mix. Yeah, I mean, for, for our work with Black Lives Matter Toronto, we've um, used direct action as a way of controlling the news story um, in very powerful ways, I would say, um, by taking, um, I guess by taking charge of uh, the directions that, that were put in front of us. So for one example, we were protesting. Um, we decided to get together to organize a vigil to remember the death of Andrew Loku, who was a black man who was killed by the police in Toronto in, in 2015. And we wanted to, to gather after the SIU results showed that there was no wrongdoing at the, at the hands of the police officers, both of whom were, one of, one of whom was, was trained in de-escalation for people with psychiatric disabilities, and, one, and he was training the other officer that night. Both of them arrived at Andrew Loku's apartment. Within 12 seconds of this interaction, he was killed. Um, and the SIU found that there was no wrongdoing. So we organized this vigil, and um, the police came and broke it up, and said that we had to move, and that we couldn't congregate at City Hall. And we decided that rather than moving to another location that the police would just then come to and ask us to move again, we would just save them some time and move the protest to police headquarters. So we ended up setting up this like 15 day occupation that was that really ran the news cycle in Toronto for that period of time in March of 2016. So just figuring out ways to kind of flip um, what's presented in front of us as options mm -hmm. um, and sort of control the narrative by doing things that are maybe a little bit unexpected um, but, but using direct action, that's yeah. what we've been doing. Yeah, and I think, I think for us, like the, the goals of like, what the kind of social change that we want to achieve are, are so enormous that there's so many different parts of what needs to happen in order to get there. And so for us as a magazine, what we are trying to do is sort of find the people who are doing the work of articulating what's wrong and who are also creating and imagining better worlds. Um, and so what we're trying to do is give their platform and also sort of give the resources that we have as a publication to mm -hmm. um, help promote those voices. Yeah. And just to say, like, the things that we're fighting for, an end to anti-blackness and an end to white supremacy, like, these are huge things, an end to yeah. systemic sexism, an end to transphobia, yeah. and, like, how do you... Um, it, necessi it necessitates us coming at it from a variety of different angles. Yeah. And so I think that the, the enormity of our job ahead of us can seem daunting. But mm. by coming at it from a variety of different ways, whether it's through the media, through direct action, through an art exhibition or a music song or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that there are all these different, you know, through scholarship and academia, there are these different ways of approaching the, the bigger question, um, which ho hopefully we will win. So. Mm -hmm. I guess the other side of that too is how do mainstream media outlets sort of either hinder or help social activism movements and the goals that you just spoke to trying to achieve um, in your experience, what effect has that had? I think if I, I can uh, jump in on here, I think one of the things that Cyrus actually pointed to and actually both Nat Natalie and Cyrus is these, uh, the movement for social justice is huge. It's multifaceted and it's always ongoing. It never stops. Um, but the other part of it is that the news media, if I were to focus on the news media per se, because this is about journalism, is that the news media tend to be episodic in their coverage. All right, so it's like whatever, and this was the thing about the direct action, and this is some of the things that we've done too. All of us have done this in some way, shape, or form, where we've organized, and I, I've done this to try and fill in the news hole. 
So knowing that the news media are going to be at a particular court, um, I will stage something at that court so that my witnesses are there to fill in whatever the news hall is. Um, in the case of the episodic kind of coverage, is it runs with you know that whole adage about if a dog bites a man, um, it's not going to get covered. But if a man bites a dog, it is going to get covered. So you're always looking for what's unusual. Where can you actually turn this around to fit into that kind of episodic coverage? But the problem with episodic coverage is that it's episode oriented. So it's, it's short term. It doesn't look at the long term. It's not a structural kind of analysis. And it doesn't look at systems until you actually bring the news media's sight to it, which is in a way what the Black Lives Matter movement has done um, using digital media and social platforms. But it's also kind of when you look at the missing and murdered women, that's exactly what's happened. It was a very short episodic kind of framing, which you still see happening. In the, in the sense of the coverage of the one woman, the one girl, like Tina Fontaine. But it's putting it into that context, which is why I think Guts Magazine you know, and Briar Patch and all of these are, as alternative media are so useful. But I also think that this is part of what we do in the kind of work we do, like even in terms of the work I do, writing about meta-narratives, which is, listen, there's a structural thing happening here and focusing on one particular instance isn't going to do it. We need to look at what are the structural roots. What is the system in place you know, that is actually upholding this? And I think that the mainstream media you know, is sort of a microcosm of a larger system and structure of power. And so you know, they're gonna be as interested in, in documenting a revolutionary moment as mainstream structures of power usually are. Um, you know, I've had, we, we've had great success with using the media to be able to get awareness out around particular cases, the case of DeFonte Miller, the, the case of Andrew Lopu, you know, really making these names, household names, to try to draw an attention to anti-blackness in Canada. But at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily say that the media and our media contacts are my allies, or my comrades, or my co-conspirators in action. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, just being able to be aware of what the difference is allows for smart direct action, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, an incident, we were um, uh, very actively involved in challenging Toronto Pride in, and, mm -hmm. in their anti-blackness, and we, we had a little sit-in in the middle of the Pride Parade in 2016, and again, we marched in 2017. And in the in-between period, there was a, a, a town hall meeting to try to address anti-blackness within the Pride organization. And me and my colleagues from Black Lives Matter went, and I was sitting there waiting to, you know, just sort of observing the, 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 the events as they were unfolding. And someone from a mainstream media outlet, which will remain nameless, came up beside me with his microphone and kind of jabbed it in my face and kind of like poked me with it and was like, come outside and give me a comment. And I was like, this is the problem. This is why you are not my kin. This is why we're not actually in the struggle together because at the end of the day, my body isn't even respected enough that you don't hit me with your, um, the objects of your job. Um, and that it's actually, I'm actually here engaged with my community trying to make change you know, in a larger way and I'm not actually here just to give you a comment or to make your story work for six o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, he literally hit me with a microphone. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the episodic thing is, is really interesting. We've been noticing this with the sort of like Me Too moment that's happening because, you know, mm -hmm. stuff around rape culture consent is stuff that we've really been talking about since the beginning of Guts and, you know, has been a conversation that's been going on mm -hmm. for an incredibly long time. And we've sort of seen a few of these cycles in the mainstream media already sort of pass through. Um, and then to see these conversations really happening in a broader way is exciting. And I think we're also, to a certain extent, I am grateful to mainstream journalists with resources who are able to pursue stuff because we have people who, like we as a publication aren't able to 
publish something that is naming names mm -hmm. because we don't have the resources to fight a legal battle and we know that like <coughs> people are very litigious and so the fact that people are willing to go to go forward with these stories we've seen that that makes an impact mm -hmm. and so as much as that happened we also see a number of those other mainstream sources then when it is a story sort of follow it in a way that feels I think really extractive as you're saying not mm -hmm. um, working to to give a context and not looking at the structures looking at trying to really pull out the mm -hmm. the most sort of painful often parts of a story in order pr to present it and then move on and I think that's like the balance that feels hard yeah mm -hmm. and I think that this point about alternative media is like a really crucial one right because by moving away from the episodic nature, I mean, because we get, we hear this too, you know, what will happen when Black Lives Matter isn't a popular thing, as mm -hmm. if anti-blackness was going to go mm -hmm. away, uh, and as if the, the work of ending white supremacy was done. Um, but yeah, you know, we've really, I really appreciate the efforts of alternative media, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to provide a different way for us to consume information, to provide different strategies. It's really amazing. Yeah. I think one of the things about the, 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 the mainstream press, I mean, these, the two experiences that I've heard are both experiences I've had. On the one hand, you know, a press that's quite hostile to any kind of message around racism, and, uh, but yet quite open to messages around sexism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, to me, it's that kind of sort of like the way in which some issues are considered worthy and, you know, salvageable and people who can be rescued and some that aren't. So I see both sides of it. But the other side thing is also how, in fact, that kind of treatment does two things. It divides groups because, of, you know, cross solidarity and cross sectoral linkages are really critical in all these movements. But it's the way in which the media does it, not only by dividing the issues, kind of like, you know, how racism would be divided from sexism so that women of color who experience both would never be seen as such. But the other part of it is the, the way in which uh, the mainstream media favors leadership within movements that are quite, that are not, or that are leaderless. And in that way, you know, there are some amazing studies that have shown how movements themselves have fallen because of that, because of this sort of like privileging of particular voices. So that's another sort of tactic of divide and rule. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that brings the other part of it, which is the whole, the way in which this, all of these sort of like um, divisions or mechanisms of control have actually uh, in a way been weakened is because of the economic base of this media has been weakened. Mm -hmm. So why would mainstream media go to alternative media? Well, part of it is because mainstream media themselves don't have the money, they don't have the stringers, they don't have the resources on the ground. So what they do is they end up trolling around the net, finding sources that will give them some kind of credence, right? And some kind of meat for the stories that they're telling. So it's almost sort of like in one way becoming a symbiotic relationship. But on the other hand, there is also what one author has termed very nicely, the huffinization of the mainstream press which is in fact how that alternative media is harnessing the labor and the power without actually, kind of like what we were talking about before, the, um, the Uber stuff, right? Which is like, how are you protecting the people who then can end up in litigious kind of circumstances? And how are you um, protecting people's livelihoods that do want to write? So I think there's a, this, a, a thing going on there that clearly needs to be parsed out and we have to do it strategically to see what will work in our interests. Right. Yeah, and you were um, alluding to the intersections of all these movements just now and I was wondering if any of you wanted to expand a little bit more on how you use your various platforms to represent intersectionality in what you're fighting for. <laughs> Well, Black Lives Matter is a, a movement that's led by queer and trans people and that focuses on the lives of disabled mm -hmm. and mad um, black people and, and their livelihoods. So it's a very intersectional movement. 
Um, and for me, yeah, it's, it's been really useful to be, like the kinds of things that I want to get involved that in are, are only coming from an intersectional lens. Um, and I think that where the media kind of falls down is that they just, it's really hard to kind of grasp that. Mm -hmm. And there's these missed opportunities. And when you mentioned Me Too, I mean, that was a campaign that was really started decades yeah. earlier by mm -hmm. a black woman, but because of the lack of intersectionality and because of anti-blackness, that was missed from the story for the first couple of days. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, oh yeah, oh, oh, actually this was already this thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyways, with Black Lives Matter, we have, you know, tried to sidestep some of the pitfalls of earlier black activism by having a very intersectional movement from the beginning. Um, and again, you know, what how that sort of doesn't get translated through the media resulted in when we did our protests in the Pride Parade, you know, tremendous amounts of extreme racism through yeah. online media saying, why are you at our parade? Mm -hmm. You should go to Carabana. Yeah. As if black queer people didn't exist, as if black trans people didn't exist, as if, I mean, I had been volunteering for Pride since 1998 at that point. You know, and while people were throwing water bottles at me, I was like, well, actually, what were you doing in 1998? I mean, it's pretty yeah. boring sometimes doing all of the volunteer grant work, but we have been here. We actually started a lot of the foundational movements, including Stonewall. Black trans mm -hmm. people did that. So, but because of the misunderstanding or the misunderstanding of, of who and what and uh, concepts of intersectionality, they saw us as black only. Yeah. And they saw, you know, queer communities' response as queer only. Mm -hmm. And by queer only, they meant white, right? So, anyways. In my work, the way that I look at intersectionality is is the sort of like these intersecting sites in a way of uh, not identity so much as categories, you know, the categories that are imposed. So so in the work that I've done and, and that I've put out in Briar Patch and a number of other places, I've compared the way in which the press looks at um, the missing and murdered indigenous women and also the Afghan women, showing in fact that there's a valence that's operative here in terms of what's a worthy victim that we can go out and rescue and what's an unworthy victim. So that's one example. The other one is looking at the ways in which the mainstream media portray Muslim youth and indigenous youth and seeing how in fact different colonial logics are operating to make one seem like the threat of a terror threat from the outside that has to be expelled, and the other uh, a threat from within that is really, go you know, uh, that fits into the whole logic of the vanishing race. Look, look what they're doing to themselves, kind of thing. So it's bringing those things together to show, in fact, that what's operating here is these categories are often being used in a really strategic way to reinforce a central ideological premise a valence of power. And that valence can be around worthiness, it can be around unworthiness, it can be around visibility, invisibility, <laughs> and really how, in fact, the identity, what we take on in terms of identity politics, because we are put into particular places, are often used very much against us by these kind of categorical descriptions. And what that means is that the kind of transversal, cross-sectoral, mobilization that needs to happen often doesn't happen because of that. And it's, it's deciphering what are these valences of power that are operating in given instances that I think becomes really critical in uncovering the way in which people are positioned differently. Yeah, yeah and I, for, for us we publish a lot of personal essays and personal stories, and I think that yeah. exactly what you're talking about sort of comes out in those when um, people are describing their lives, it's not in these sort of single issue threads, and so when people are able to describe the way that power and oppression work, um, both like in their lives mm -hmm. and in their communities, it's not just it's not just a single issue. And so those, the ways that those intersect and, and interact, um, I think come across really clearly as soon as someone uh, is sharing their story. Mm -hmm. um, so then, 
I guess, what is the role of allyship for journalists who um, cover, discuss, or represent these issues, and for these journalists who are not necessarily impacted by them in the same way due to their background or identity? Um, and how should such a journalist try to navigate that terrain? <coughs> I think allyship becomes really problematic in one sense because to have an ally, you have to have an equitable relation, balance of power, right? So if a journalist is inside an organization and that organization only valorizes particular kinds of quotes that are from particular kinds of spokespeople, which we know in the news tend to be people who, are, who have legitimized authority, right? I, I, I realize this as a university professor. I have more authority in terms of saying something and it's going to be reported more likely than somebody who's on the street. So there are all of these sort of like aspects of legitimacy and power and that are entrapped in that position. So how then does the journalist do that? And I, the one exa successful example that I've seen, actually two, uh, one was around the missing and murdered Aboriginal women. The, the whole story that began in British Columbia began with a couple of journalists who were realizing and who were connected to the communities that, hey, there's all these, these women that are missing and what's happening here? And so they took it upon themselves to actually start an investigation. It wasn't something that was sanctioned by their paper, they just started, and they started writing about it. So even though they were constrained within the episodic frames, they continued and continued and continued. And I think that was what created that, you know, and then everybody else kind of joined in and, and that created that whole sort of wave of uh, attention that was brought to that. The second thing is uh, a story that I've written about that the Globe and Mail did called Unfounded. And it's all the cases of uh, the sexual assaults that the police had found to be unfounded. So the Globe actually commissioned its own reporters to take on this massive in investigation. And what they uncovered was incredible, actually, in terms of how the police were not taking these women seriously. But the Globe, with the power that it had behind it, was able to galvanize this to an extent where they were able to call uh, on the RCMP to change. They then sort of like went to the, to the politicians and the politicians had to respond. So that's where you actually got to see the power of the press. And it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for women reporters themselves experiencing this firsthand, right? So how, this is where allyship becomes a bit problematic if you don't have that experience and you don't share power. And if I were to look at a, a classic example in anthropology, because this issue has come up in anthropology, is how does the field worker or the investigator who is out there in the field, tapping into the stories of all these people, actually acknowledge the stories that he or she is collecting? And one way would be in terms of co-authorship, right? So it's how do you actually bring people in to tell a story? And that becomes a very powerful way, particularly when you think about how to counter the huffinization of the news. Yeah, I think for me it's, it's partly where I guess I have like almost an issue with I think how a lot of journalism happens in terms of the idea of objectivity um, yes. because I think that it's often just used as um, a way to sort of invisibilize stuff like whiteness mm -hmm. and like you know various like disnormativity, settler colonialism, and so when you're talk when um, a journalist is wanting to talk about something like settler colonialism, they're not doing it. Whatever position yeah. they occupy within that, they're within that system. Um, if they have more power within that, they, they're still operating within it. And so the idea of uh, coming at anything just completely neutrally, I think, isn't is possible. possible. Yeah. And so for me, the, the best way then to do that is to recognize what position you occupy within that and what you're bringing to 
the issue that you're covering and doing the amount of research that you need to do in order to adequately yeah. address it, but I'm not sure that's always enough. Yeah. And I, I mean, the only thing I would add to this is to say that, I mean, yes, all of these things are in relation to power and opportunity and, but, but I mean, fundamentally, um, without, the reality is, is that the majority of reporters are not from marginalized, the marginalized communities that we're trying to, that we're talking about here. Um, and so as a result, you know, the majority of reporters are from sort of dominant positions of power. And if they're not able to take on doing the radical work that their paper requires them, then they're actually just not even doing their job, mm -hmm. right? And that, that actually is a fundamental flaw. There's a flaw in the school system. If the school system is not teaching journalists to come out with a kind of critical analysis and the kind of you know, engaged understanding of anti-oppression values that allows them to be able to dive into these stories, mm -hmm. then there's a, there's a fundamental flaw. Because otherwise, the alternative is what we see happen, which is where there's the one reporter of color yes. who gets assigned to every single thing that has to do with race, mm -hmm. gender, trans stuff, pride, I don't know, the, anything that's like not white, cis, heteronormative, they get, everything else gets dumped onto their plate. And that actually is, I think, also a failing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we need to better support journalists of color, absolutely, but we also need to ensure that all of the journalists that are coming into these environments are actually equipped to be able to do this work, that notwithstanding all of the conversations around privilege mm -hmm. and around access to power, because I think that those are so beautifully articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. But I think that there's another element to it, which is like, the journalists of color that are in there that bear the burden of representation, right? That's how Corbina Mercer called it. The other part of that is also the fact that within newsrooms there is a culture. And people have to toe the line of that culture. And if they don't, they actually get whacked really badly. So their jobs are usually tenuous. Uh, they get treated very badly. They get ostracized. They're not part of the in-group. You know, the same thing that happens in any total institution, right? Even the academy. So how then do you support the journalists that are within, that are telling these stories? It's really hard, I think, to, and, I, and I'm thinking about an example of uh, a journalist, a, a columnist, actually, Patricia Pearson, who used to work for the National Post. And um, she, she said, she, she actually wrote about this. She said, anything I would write about Palestine, I had to be so guarded that there, I knew that it would be jettisoned. And she, she, it got to the point where she, she just couldn't because Izzy Asper's family owned the paper, right? And so the power would come down in terms of how and what she could write. And she wrote about this when she left and she started working for the Globe and Mail. The problem is we also have a massive concentration of power and monopoly in, in terms of the news media in Canada. So where, where are these journalists to go if they, if they don't want to work within that system? The only place is outside that system, and that's in the realm of the alternative. But that's also a realm, as you well know, that isn't well supported. You know, has to fight for the kind of credibility and legitimacy that is necessary for those voices to be heard. And I think this is where we really, sometimes I feel like the only place is the parallel universes. <laughs> Forget about, you know, yeah. trying to live in this world. Yeah. Um, so we just have about 10 minutes left now, so I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience if there are any. Well, fundamentally, I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement is an example 
of the very thing that you're describing, right? Because you have you know, at least 500 years of black resistance on this continent, for sure a very active 50 years of black organizing and black radical tradition. Um, but when Black Lives Matter came around, the media reported on it, maybe because of the episode, as if it was a brand mm -hmm. new thing, as if this was new and never been done before, or, or following the lines of the one and only speech that Martin Luther King ever wrote, <laughs> as if he wasn't a pro prolific scholar. Anyways, uh, so I think that one of the things that we, there's a, a group, electronic music group in Toronto called Lao, and they have a line from one of their songs, Brand Eyed Warriors, where they say, it's not all we've got, but they still can't figure this shit out. And it sort of is talking about how within activist movements, we actually have so many resources and so much creativity um, that the state knows about 1% of it, and they still can't figure out what we're doing. And so mm -hmm. I think that when we get those requests from the media, they do tend to not only just focus any conversation around blackness, just specifically asking us, as Black Lives Matter Toronto to give a comment when there are actually many black groups that they could contact, even within our own steering team, there's certain people that they will always ask for comment mm -hmm. without realizing that we're a collective. So the media requests actually come to all of us and so we chuckle and laugh and then we decide who's willing to take on talking to that reporter today, whether they ask for Sandy or they ask for me. If we decide they're getting me, they're getting me, you know? So. Um, that's been one of the things that we've done as a strategy is to just try to interrupt some of those direct lines that they try to, you know, carve into into stone. Um, but I think fundamentally, there are there are countless groups that they could contact, but they actually haven't done the groundwork or legwork to get connected with other Black activist groups. So then we are sort of the the main go to. Mm -hmm. I wish there was schools you could go to where you could just study activist culture. Uh, but I think, I mean, the generation that I grew up in, certainly in the 90s, it was very uh, built in that you, you would take direction from older activists and that you would seek out knowledge and information from activists who had already done work before. I don't know that that's necessarily true anymore, but that was definitely true when I was coming up. and so. Um, but I mean, anyways, I think if you're on your own and just trying to do your own research, it's really difficult because, uh, you know, Donna Haraway writes about the unarchivable and activist movements are inherently unarchivable. It's really difficult. For a lot of very strategic reasons, we've tried to make sure that our names aren't recorded <laughs> and that certain events aren't recorded, but also they're just ephemeral, you know, mm -hmm. activism is very ephemeral. So, um, you know, without a sort of a, an archive, of activist movements, it can be really tricky to find out information. One example is, you know, in the last 20 years, public perception, because of the media, of the Black Panther Party has almost completely changed. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing organizing in the 90s, and we were organizing around anti-blackness, and I was very interested in the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. there was this m d dominant mainstream narrative of the Black Panther Party as being a very negative thing, that they were terrible, that they were terrorists, that there was da 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 da, right? Whereas now, 20 years later, the news cycle has changed, and now we talk about their free health programs and the free free breakfast programs, and like just the public perception of the Panthers has completely changed, even though the things that they've done actually haven't changed at all. The facts and the history is there. Mm -hmm. But again, 20 years ago, without the internet, it was really hard to get information. We knew that they had done great work it was really difficult to find out in history about, about our movement in that way. Now, there's information, but you know, I'm, I'm always wary. I mean, Wikipedia articles can change any time, right? So, mm -hmm. anyways. Did either of you want to add to that? No, I think that's a brilliant example, and I'm, I'm actually thinking that maybe the whole, the, the new Black Panther movement, uh, the film that's yeah. out, it may be actually a way in which you, uh, in a way to trivialize this. You know, because that work, <laughs> yeah, because that was a thing. It was at that time when it came out. It was a, it was a movement that so uh, terrified the U.S. government because this is like a, 
not only an armed movement, but a disciplined movement, you know, with trying to create exactly the same thing, a parallel world. They weren't going to get equity. They weren't going to get recognized in the white world. They were going to create their own. And that's how it became such a threat. And so thinking about how it's, it was actually archived. One of the interesting things about the Panther is that the, the movement itself is that all the, the uh, its newspapers are actually available yeah. online in PDF form. So you can actually see this. But the way in which it was done where you created your own symbols and you, uh, you used, you, you created your own language actually mm -hmm and how this was done. So there's an enormous amount of information there. But the question is, what's coming out? So the, it's funny that you would say that, because here you don't hear about the free breakfasts and all of those programs that were part and parcel of this movement. But in Toronto, you would. Yes. So it's like, where, in fact, is this information revolving? That becomes a really important thing, right? But then again, thinking about, OK, so, so now you've got this Marvel comic, which was apparently a comic even at that time, um, coming out now in this fully fledged film. How many of you have heard about it, the Panther film? That's, yeah, that everybody wants to go out and see. And whether it's yet once again a kind of reworking of this and a way to demythologize and uh, evacuate the revolutionary potential of that was in that, right? He's been waiting for a while. No, well, I was just going to ask about, uh, you, um, you mentioned the exit strategy, right? Like, in terms of how the media can pull out a story, like, they lack like an investment on their part, uh, or they don't really have the incentive to tell these stories. Um, and this goes for everybody on the panel as well. Um, so what kind of uh, devices or strategies have worked to make it harder for these uh, organizations to leave those stories alone, to uh, really disentangle themselves from the story? So from which, uh, from the perspective of the organizations, that want the news attention, or from the perspective of the news organization that wants to withdraw? Well, I mean, like, on the perspective, like, uh, what uh, you all have been doing to combat that um, tendency to pull away from these stories, pull, like, uh, uh, stick to that episodic approach? You stage events. Yeah. That's what you do. <laughs> you stage events. So you know what's newsworthy. You use the criteria of newsworthiness against the organization itself. So you try and do things like, for instance, you remember here when the student protests were happening? You remember the casseroles? That whole thing that was, that was precisely about that. The symbol of the maple leaf was precisely about that. So you, you try and use the cultural symbols that are there, because that's the only arena you can play in, to actually mount something that will capture that attention. We had a, there was a case of a woman named Beverly Bram who was married to a Canadian. Her son was born in Canada, was six weeks old. She was facing deportation. Couldn't get picked up by the mainstream media at all, in part because they are, you know, in general quite slow about covering uh, deportation cases, but, you know, also in, in this particular case. And so what we did was we knew that they needed a story uh, by nine, you know, by sort of the morning cycle, um, we knew that the morning was a really busy time in Toronto when we could probably get everybody's attention, and we knew that Young and Bloor was the main intersection that everybody sort of uses to commute in the morning, and so it's also one of those intersections where you can cross on the diagonal. So there's a, a period of time when it's an all-way cross, so that there's no cars in the intersection. So we. Um, went into the middle of the intersection at that time, set up a press conference, put a table down, put chairs, and rat -a -tat -tat. Yeah. We secured the intersection with protesters, and we had a press conference with Beverly Bram, with her son in her arms, with her husband, with representatives from No One Is Illegal and representatives from Black Lives Matter, and we notified the media ahead of time. And of course, they, I mean, they didn't want to cover Beverly Bram that day. That's the last thing on their, what, of what they wanted. They could not ignore it. There was no way to ignore a protest in the middle of the intersection at Young and Bloor at 8.30 in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. So it was just being very aware of what their requirements are and what's on their, what, what they need, and then figuring a way for us to provide some of that content. 
um, in our, on our own terms. It doesn't always work, I might add. It doesn't yeah. always work because I remember the, the, uh, one of the things that the women's movement used to do. And this is where you, get, you have to know what, what is happening. You have to know what different things mean. But the women's movement um, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, what they would do in Canada is they knew that when the budget was going to be unveiled, the tradition was that the Minister of Finance would have to go and buy a pair of new shoes. This is the thing. We, if you don't know this, it doesn't make sense. So on that day, what all the women's organizations across the country would do is they would gather from beforehand all the old shoes, everybody's old shoes. And, they, and you know you can send this stuff free to Ottawa, right? If you're sending it to a minister, you can send it free. They would just ship all these shoes and the minister's office would be flooded with these boxes of old shoes. And it was a signal to say, that we as women are waiting to see what are you going to do in terms of this budget that is actually going to, you know, figure our needs into account or take our needs into account. It didn't always work because, again, you need to know that this is a tradition. You need to know what shoes mean and so forth. So it's like knowing the lay of the land becomes really critical. And it's like knowing that, okay, this particular intersection, if you don't, grab it, you know, that's not, it's not going to work otherwise, right? Yeah. 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 So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But thank you so much, Cyrus, Yasmin, and Natalie for sharing your knowledge with us today. And thanks to all of you for coming out to our journalism conference. Um, right after this, in this room, we have Ciro Scotty, uh, former editor at Bloomberg, um, Business Week, and writers. Um, so he'll be giving a lecture in here. Um, and we'll also be having our mixer on Wednesday at 8 p.m. in Gertz. Please come to that. And thank you so much for coming. <laughs>
Yeah, well, this is, the, I mean, now there's, but I mean, in the 90s, it was like, we didn't have, yeah, we didn't have anything. Yeah, it just, it's such a game changer. Yeah. Just, like, there's something yeah. Else. yeah. Yeah. Even look up something that's incorrect that someone wrote, you can do now, yeah. which we didn't have. Yeah. You know? So it's so much we would provide on hearsay or on top of the other um, activists or on this Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, thank you, Nick, for inviting me um, this, to this intimate gathering. <laughs> uh, I'm not a great public speaker, so I'm going to have to read. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's wonderful to be here at McGill, to uh, visit Montreal, to be in Canada, a country where the most worrisome thing about the leader is what he's going to wear next. Uh, in America, we wake up every morning worried about what the president will say next and how much of it is true. Uh, earlier this month, Marty Barron, the editor of the Washington Post, delivered a lecture at Oxford in which he said that his newspaper's fact checkers had counted more than 2,000 false or misleading claims by the president in, by President Trump in his first full year in office. And that doesn't include statements made during the presidential campaign of 2016. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that in the United States, the truth and the press that attempts to deliver it are under assault. In January, the BBC tried to get at the current roots of fake news. It traced the arc of fake news back to, the, to mid-2016, uh, when BuzzFeed discovered more than 140 sites who were pumping out disinformation and racking up enormous numbers on Facebook. Many of the sites were registered in a Macedonian town called Bellas, and they were generated, and they generated headlines such as FBI agents suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder-suicide, and Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump for president. We're going to get back to Pope in a minute. Um, but what the BBC says Buzz, BuzzFeed uncovered was, quote, a unique marriage between social media algorithms advertising systems, people prepared to make stuff up to earn some easy cash, and an election that gripped a nation and much of the world. Obviously, the disinformation campaign that roiled the 2016 American presidential election went beyond some teenagers in Macedonia. But who was behind the phony stories and bogus posts will perhaps become clearer once Robert Mueller, as you know, the 
special prosecutor investigating the Russian meddling in the U.S. democratic electoral process finishes his work. Still, while there may not be evidence yet of Russia colluding with the Trump campaign to, to disrupt the election, Donald Trump has become one of the standard bearers for the term fake news. In January 2016, according to the BBC, Trump first started repeating the words fake news on Twitter, and he has used those words, well, quite liberally since then, <laughs> often against reporting that he finds critical or at odds with policies he espouses. Now the notion of fake news is spread around the world with other global leaders, such as Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines using it, and others beyond him. I uh, just didn't get a chance to list them all. Uh, it's just, you know, fake news has become a handy tool for politicians under fire. Claire Wardle, Wardle of First Draft, that's a project at Harvard's Shorenstein Center that works to expose and combat mis- and disinformation, said this to the BBC. In the early days of Twitter, people would call it a self-cleaning oven because, yes, there were falsehoods, but the community would quickly debunk them. But now we're at a scale where if you add in automation and bots, that oven is overwhelmed. There are many, many more people now acting as fact checkers and trying to clean up all the ovens, but it's at a, at a scale that we just can't keep it up, unquote. So how do journalists deliver news that can stand up to daily efforts to subvert the truth by people in power and ideological troll, trolls with an ax to grind? Excuse me. In a message released by the Vatican in January, Pope Francis, told you we'd get back to him, spoke out against the spreading of falsehoods. He said journalists were, quote, protectors of news and called the profession a mission. Informing others, the Pope wrote, means forming others. It means being in touch with people's lives. That is why ensuring the accuracy of sources and protecting communication are real means of promoting goodness, generating trust, and opening the way to communion and peace, unquote. Some of that may seem a little high-minded if you're a reporter on deadline trying to pump out a story, but the Pope is actually on to something. The best way for journalists to fight back against attempts to discredit their reporting is to bulletproof their stories. Unfortunately, in this era of lean staffs and dwindling resources, coupled with a 24-7 news cycle and intense competitive pressure that has been ratcheted up by the internet and smartphones, bulletproofing a piece is harder than ever. In the heyday of news magazines, where I spent a lot of my career, there were line editors scanning your copy for holes, holes and errors. There were nitpicky copy editors critiquing your usage and looking for syllogisms or, and non sequiturs or just a wandering comma. There were researchers and fact checkers eager to poke holes. And then there were top editors who took delight in demonstrating their superior knowledge. But <laughs> what was produced, if done properly, could be irrefutable, was irrefutable actually in many, most cases at uh, the magazine I worked for, which is when I worked at Business Week, now Bloomberg's at Business Week, the slightest error that got into print was taken seriously because a sloppy mistake or, you know, God forbid, a factual error was thought to raise questions in the mind of the reader about the veracity of the entire story. Getting to that level today is difficult if you're not working for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Bloomberg, Reuters, or some other publication or site that still has significant resources. But it's not impossible. For a sensitive story, you should always strive for multiple sources. Two can be acceptable, three or more is better, one doesn't cut it. You should always have an eye out for legal issues also. My spell check is great, having the person that next desk next to you, give your copy a read, can be invaluable. In fact, there are other useful tips at the website I mentioned, First Draft, uh, at, at the, Harvard, uh, the Harvard project at Shorenstein Center. What is most important, though, is to be totally committed to integrity, fairness, and principled reporting, and to re reject gotcha journalism. This is a moment for journalists to examine how they operate in the age of Facebook and Twitter 
because as blessed as the Pope thinks the press is, it has plenty of faults to support the narrative that is slanting the news or selectively reporting. I'm often dismayed to see reputable journalists, especially political journalists, tweeting out digs of politicians and officials or retweeting the critical views of others. Doing so often betrays a bias. You should be confident enough in a story or column to take the heat online without slapping back. Recently, I wrote a column in the Daily Beast about Kirsten Gillibrand, the New York senator who seems to be positioning herself for a presidential bid in 2020. I suggested she was running against a political zeitgeist by flip-flopping on a number of issues. But many on Twitter took it as an attack on her because she had led the effort to oust Al Franken from the Senate over allegations of sexual misconduct. And there was a barrage of tweets accusing me of not being comfortable with strong women. My wife's favorite comment was, what's the matter? Was mommy mean to you? <laughs> but I kept quiet because unless you were accused of being factually inaccurate, there's no future in going to war on Twitter. However, it's not just tweeting and retweeting that raises questions about journalistic fairness and standards. Oprah Winfrey, an enormously successful entertainer and business person, is now a special correspondent on 60 Minutes. Why is that okay? On one channel, she can be reporting for the most venerable TV news program in history. Click the remote and she's hawking, oh, that's good mashed potatoes, one of the items with a touch of cauliflower in her new prepared food line. In addition, she has been a sp spoken of as a possible presidential candidate. She's traded barbs with Trump online, and she's been a forceful supporter of Democrats. If Trump is criticized for not fully divesting his business interests while president, why is it acceptable for Oprah to be running money-making businesses while acting as a so-called journalist? That's the sort of double standard that undermines the press and provides ammunition to its critics. With all the lies, disinformation, and twisting of the facts, there is a hunger, grow, there is a growing hunger out there for truth. Recently, I talked with Dove Seedman, whose firm LRN helps corporation, corporations raise their standards. In the climate we are in, he sees integrity and principled behavior as a competitive advantage. He wrote a book about 10 years ago, whose title now really resonates. It's called How why how we do anything means everything. I believe that for journalists, Seidman's message is doubly important, because how we do journalism these days means everything. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, I think you're right. Some of these stories would not be taking place if it weren't for anonymous sources. And, of course, it's always better to get people on the record. But, you know, it's a, it's a tricky business, anonymous sources, especially in Washington. And I think, you know, Brian Ross and ABC used two anonymous sources. To, I can't remember what, he was, what, what the story was, but he got it completely wrong. And uh, he's since been, I don't think they fired him, but they pulled them back from online duty. So, I mean, I think, you know, if you got a really good, you know, it's a really good story. Um, it has, you know, implications for government poli policy. Um, you know, you use anonymous sources judiciously and, um, you, you know, you, you can't just use one, as I said. You can't. You know, you really need more than more than three for a story like that. And even you know, in these days, you know, like the Times will have and the Post will have five or six people within the administration. Um, you know, and it's. 
I think it's, that's a judgment the editors have to make. Is this story worth, is, is what we're going to impart to readers, is it important enough, is it worthwhile, you know, is the reputational risk worthwhile? Well, you know, I think there's a role for, you know, media personalities um, of all stripes. Um, and I did, you mentioned the sports reporting, I did just see that, I think it's Derek Jeter has got some sort of site going where it's just ex-athletes doing the reporting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I think, you know, the press is under attack and its, it's truthfulness is under attack. It's skewing of the news quote skewing the news is under attack. So I think we really need to get back to the old time basics of trying to be as fair and as principled and as um, nonpartisan as possible. And you know, having a profile, you know, I love Maggie Haberman of the Times. Um, and uh, I, did love, I did love Gren Thrush too uh, before he got hit with uh, some misconduct allegations. But, um, you know, they both do a lot of tweeting. And I, I really think that detracts from her. You know, she's a star, star political reporter for the Times. I think that, you know, having a presence um, on Twitter for her, if it's not really breaking news with, with some, you know, solid reporting she's done, uh, but just going back and forth with people, I think that really diminishes her profile. It doesn't, you know, probably makes her more of a celebrity, but, you know, it also makes her less credible in my eyes. Um, so. Okay, well, Well, I think usually a source has an agenda, um, you know, of some sort, unless they're just, you know, a, a principal whistleblower who sees wrongdoing and wants to expose it. Um, but, I, you know, sources don't come out of the woodwork. They're people that, you know, you talk with over the years or decades or, you know, you, usually you, you don't trust somebody's somebody just coming out of the woodwork and coming to you with a story, then you really got to, you know, do a lot of work to, to uh, find out if what they're saying is accurate or not. But I think, you know, you develop sources, reporters develop sources over time. They, you know, they rely on their experience with that source to, to say, you know, is this person trustworthy or not, but, you know. And also to, to, to understand what their agenda is, to understand where they're coming from. So, yeah, I mean, I think you have to treat every source individually and, um, you know, just not take what they're saying at face value, but on the other hand, use your experience with that source to color your acceptance of what they're saying. <laughs> um, we can have this conversation in a bar, you know. <laughs> 
best thing to do is have fewer resources. Um, I'm sure you've heard about um, um, who's, um, what the, the, the guy who just lost the uh, um, oh, um, Anyway, there, there was, there was a, um, a, a woman from a conservative organization who was undercover went to quarters of the Washington Post pretending um, that she had um, been abused as a teenager by the yeah. Um, but that was a false story. It was, it right. Was, the, the point of it was to track the supporters from the post. So a story like that, where it's a personal experience, and I'm not, you can't have a second source for something that happened in the future to live in the back of his car in the 70s. How can you still, they, like, they, they, they caught her because she lied about some address and they checked the address. Well, I think they caught her because she had been hanging around Washington Post events like, you know, going away parties and things like that. And so they, they were suspicious of her to begin with. And then they actually actually tailed her, I think, and found her going into the offices of um, yeah. that guy, okay. that guy, that young guy who, uh, you know, does the right wing videos, oftentimes, you know, staged. Um, so, you know, I think somebody comes comes with you, like as I said, someone comes with you out of the woodwork. I mean, she's coming, not coming out of the woodwork. She's someone that these reporters were like, you know, this woman's, you know, something shady's going on with her. So um, they were, they, their antenna, antenna I were up already with her. Um, but, you know, I don't think you can base a story on one person coming out of the woodwork. Obviously, you get, you know, really got to nail that down. And I think also, you know, reporters who've been doing this for a while get a, get a sort of sense of smell about what's, what smells rotten and what is really, you know, um, a you know, truthful, viable story. I don't want to hold you guys up. Thank you very much.